All right, good evening. <laughs> Welcome. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Brawley City Council and successor agency to Brawley Community Redevelopment Agency. This is our regular meeting agenda for Tuesday, November 16th, 2021 at 6 p.m. here in City Council Chambers. We'll have the roll call. Councilmember Nava? Here. Councilmember Castro? Here. Councilmember Wharton? Here. Mayor Pro Temp Couchman? Here. Mayor Hamby? Here. All right, at this time I'd like to welcome Pastor Andy McCandless from Brawley Assembly of God Church to come and offer our invocation tonight. Good evening. It's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight and uh, I'd like just to go before the Lord for a blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for, we, for the opportunity we have to turn to you in our times of leadership, in our times of uh, service. And Lord God, I pray for each council member and each member that's represented here, for the various departments that are represented. Lord, I just pray for protection and blessing upon the various service men and women in our community, whether it's in uh, law enforcement, whether it's in the fire department and public service or works in the medical professions and the teachers in our schools. Lord, we pray for protection during this difficult time we find ourselves in. Lord God, give us wisdom to navigate through these uh, challenges that we're facing, Lord God, but give us patience and courage to do what is right, what is honorable, and what is true. We pray this in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Item 2D, this will be an introduction of a, of a couple of police officers. Um, in the place of Chief of Police Jimmy Duran, we have Commander McNish. Good evening, City Council. Um, wanted to introduce, or at least the intent was to introduce two officers. Unfortunately, one of those officers will not be with us tonight, but we will look forward to introducing him at a, at a later City Council meeting. We do have here in front of us Officer Duran, Dorian, I apologize, Sarabia. He is a graduate from the IVC Post Academy. He graduated June of this year, and he is a Valley native, and he knew since his early years in high school he wanted to be a police officer, so we're glad to have him. He wanted to express his level of gratitude to the city and to the police department for uh, providing him an opportunity to work here as a police officer, and eventually he would like to be a canine handler or a task force officer. So with that, we're extremely happy to have him as part of our family and looking forward to his growth. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Welcome much. aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. I think the mics are starting to get a little hot. I know. That's usually what happens. Item three, consent agenda. Items are approved by one motion. Council members or members of the public may request consent. Items be considered separately at a time determined by the mayor. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. I'll second that. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Item four, city manager report. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just real briefly, I, I want to take the opportunity 
to uh, especially thank our city staff for this last week of, of wonderful events with the chamber and the uh, cattle call committee. Uh, lots and lots of participation and our staff, public safety, fire police, uh, streets and utilities, parks, were working around the clock nonstop and there was very few hiccups, if any. So it was very, we do appreciate that. That's a real tough week for our folks, but I wanted to take this opportunity to thank them. All right, a lot of good feedback. Only hiccups from people over drinking probably? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe. I was home early, bro. I was home, home early. early. Yeah. <laughs> like early morning or early? No. <laughs> Earlier than usual, let's put it that way. <laughs> Item five, public hearing, 5A. Our first public hearing is a discussion and potential action to adopt resolution number 2021 Resolution of the City Council of the City of Brawley, California, amending the general plan by adopting the environmental justice element. This will be presented by our planning director, Gordon Gaste. Backup is on pages 34 through 70. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Gordon Gay's Development Services Director. Um, this uh, element uh, was required several years ago. It started being required by the state. Um, we planned on, on adopting it uh, several years earlier, but, you know, it's just uh, been busy. <laughs> so uh, we actually got a, a grant with uh, the SB2 grant where we got some money to do this. Uh, we didn't get a consultant. We did this all in-house. Uh, and I want to give credit mostly to Andrea Montano, who was uh, spearheaded this and did most of the work. I was just more an advisory capacity. And, uh, you know, this is, like I said, uh, a required element. Uh, it can be updated again uh, next time we do our general plan update, which uh, probably the city needs to do within the next uh, three or four years. Um, it, it, it is, uh, like I said, a, a, a very uh, important element in terms of also, again, achieving grants. Be uh, I, was just work I was working with Rachel on the roof for the, uh, the Lions Center, and one of the questions was, do you have an environmental justice element? And uh, we answered, uh, well, we will soon, <laughs> basically, is what, what, what we answered right now. So, uh, you know, these things are all give you points on grants and uh, complying with the state uh, statutes. So, if I may, I'd like to let Andrea give the presentation. Okay, good afternoon, council members, mayor. Um, we, I also want to thank Comité Civico. They also provided a lot of support to me throughout this whole um, drafting process. Um, I don't know if you guys actually want me to go through the whole presentation or if you guys had any questions that you guys would rather me um, answer those. That will I will leave up to, up to your discretion. Rock and roll. All right. Mm -hmm. So, like Gordon said, this is one of the required elements that we're required that we have to do. That was start. It, we had to do it after we adopted the housing element, which you guys have previously um, approved. So, just some of the key points that we discuss in the EJ element. We really just go a little bit into what exactly environmental justice is, the background of the different requirements. Um, our city demographics and the three areas that we focused on as far as environmental justice goes was air quality, community engagement, and active and healthy living. Um, like Gordon said, we can always update these in the future, and I do plan on doing that whenever we get to the point that we update our general plan. Um, so the state's definition of environmental justice, that's really what's in all the documents. Well, that's what's um, approved in the state legislation. Um, so it's just a fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people of all races, cultures, incomes, and national origins with respect to development, adoption, um, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, so really what required the environmental justice element was SB 1000. 
um, that was approved in 2016, and it required um, cities and counties with disadvantaged communities to develop either a standalone document like we did or um, update their policies to include environmental justice um, policies. Um, so we... Um, this talks a little bit more about what the disadvantaged communities are. We actually have three. They're all broken down into census tracts. So everything that you see in red is disadvantaged. Um, 104, 105, and 107, those are within, and also 106, those are the census tracts we have within our boundaries. So the only one that isn't disadvantaged is 106. So that's... Um, pretty much the um, southwest portion of the city. So looking at the demographics, um, so 104 and 105, I mean 104 and 107, those are the other side of the tracks. Um, so that's where we see um, there is um, lower medium household incomes, um, the lower um, disposable income levels. Um, we have more households below the poverty level. So that kind of goes into play what we've, you know, people usually say, you know, well, on the other side of the tracks or on the east side of the tracks, you know, it's not the same as on the west side. And that, that's not, you know, from stuff we did. It's, you know, historical stuff that now we're having to um, correct through documents like these. So that's just more um, more of a visual of our different demographics that we have. So as far as social injustices go, I think a really good um, example, especially in the city, is Peer Girl. And that's one of the ones where we've slowly started to try to correct it, working with different state organizations. Um, and you can see how the public input really played a part in correcting Pure Girl. Mm -hmm. So as far as um, our objectives and policies for air quality, um, one of the biggest things we want to do is try to work with all the different organizations to improve our air quality. I don't think that's, I think that's something most people know, you know, we have we don't have the best air quality here. It's also affected by the Salton Sea, so that's one of the things that we do want to try to um, improve. But that, you know, goes with all the different cities in in our area. Um, we want to also improve community engagement. I know at least from the planning commission side of it, we don't usually have the biggest engagement with different policies or different projects that we have going on unless it's something that's um, really a, a really big talking point in the community. So trying to get more people involved is also um, important because a lot of people, they don't really know how much they, how much their voice actually matters. Um, the biggest one that we focused on, not, not making, you know, the other ones less important, but active and healthy living. Um, we have, 72% of the population, we are either um, food secure or in a food desert. And that makes up 69% of our housing. So a food desert is an area where different, where residents are both low income and have low access to supermarkets that carry affordable, nutritious food. <laughs> So is looking at the um, looking at the vulnerability index um, of obesity, the county is rated um, in the 99, 99.78 compared to yeah. the rest of the state and compared to the rest of California, we're rated 100. So that's one of the areas that we want to try to reduce obesity through different through different programs, whether it's nutrition programs, exercise programs. Um, yeah, so that's, Do you have any key that's a big number. This? Is that because of the cheap the access, easy access to cheap 
food. It's, you know, fast um, food. It's a little bit of everything. So I know we did a survey and that kind of go ties into our tree canopy percentage. Um, 2.9% of Brawley is in a tree canopy. So that means that there's trees around people. We do, I mean, we there's certain areas where you can go where you see a lot of trees. Some areas they don't. So that really goes into play with making it comfortable to actually go outside and exercise. Because if it's hot, no one's really going to want to go outside. No one wants to go outside and walk with their kids. So that's one of the things that we did get in the survey. People saying, you know, incorporate more shade, more trees into the different parks. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we can maybe explore when we're looking at grants or any other areas so we have it's not a big shocker but we have 68 days of extreme heat in the valley um so that incorporating trees or shaded areas would make it easier for people to actually go out and exercise what does that mean to be more vulnerable to obesity it doesn't necessarily mean that 100 percent of our residents are, are more obese than the rest of the country but we're more vulnerable to it it just means that that we don't have access to the areas to work out or the yeah. healthier foods or nutritionists. Yeah. Sedentary lifestyle. I mean, those sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, so the, too, the right? Center for Disease Control has yeah. a social vul- vulnerability index mm-hmm. where they discuss, a, there's a bunch of different things that they discuss on there. So it, they discuss tree canopies, extreme heat days. Um, so all of the different factors, and there's a multitude of factors, goes into... Um, all the different percentages that we see. Mm -hmm. So this is just compared to other areas. This is where we fall in terms of being susceptible to being obese. Yeah, what's interesting about that is we we live in kind of a salad bowl, right? We're known for producing um, fresh fruits, you know, and and vegetables um, in in, in the desert. What's the percentage for for the rest of the country? There's, like you said, it's very complex, but there's kind of an education component, too. You know, we we live in a world, not just here, right, where uh, most of our food comes in a box or a package. You know, in other words, it's processed Mm -hmm. versus whole food. So, you know, there's there's very much a social... um, sort of education and understanding component. And interestingly, that that's, that tends to be the lesser expensive food in the grocery store is to shop in the produce aisle. Yeah. Yeah, there's it's a, it's an, a complex um, subject matter to kind yeah. of dissect and figure out, okay, exactly what exactly is it that we need to focus on? Because yep. it's, it's not just one, one thing. It's yeah. not. I mean, we can even look at, you know, economic development and like, the the companies and restaurants that are attracted to environments like ours, yeah, and that's a, that's another discussion we can have and spend yeah. an hour on. You know what I mean? But but it's true. Food, it's like food's cheap, right? right? Taco right. Bell's right, you know, inexpensive, right. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. right? And not to yeah. maybe point them out, but I'm just saying it's like all of the fast food locations, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. it, the access to food that's inexpensive, yeah. right? And you know that's who's out here. Yeah, we have donut shops everywhere. You know, iced tea, <laughs> yeah. sweetened. Yeah. You know, with a lot of uh, anyway. Yeah. Andre, I had one other question about mm-hmm. the the, um, the statistics. Um, you talked about um, the the median household incomes and home prices and home values and that kind of stuff in the different sectors of town. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know how old those those uh, numbers are? Um, not right now. I got those um, off of the Esri databases. I can go back and maybe let you you guys email all of you guys tomorrow. I don't know when those were pulled from. I think they typically use the latest census information. So that wouldn't include the census that we just finished because it's not 100% finalized. Um, But I can double check that for you. Okay. Thank you. So as far as um, active and healthy living, one of the things we want to try to do is increase mobility and physical activity. So that kind of ties into the um, shade on the tree canopies that we would need to try to incorporate. Um, Maybe showcasing our parks a different way that maybe shows, okay, you can do this at this park, this at this this park, something like that. Um, We want to... Encourage developments to include multimodal um, modes of transportation, so not just cars, um, you know, bike paths, walkable, 
uh, walkable <laughs> walkable air, yeah. areas you know because we have we do have some some bike paths you know but they don't go they don't go everywhere you know you can't dedicated thank you thank you yeah. <laughs> dedicated bike path so something like that would make it easier you know if someone wants to bike with their kids somewhere you know you can maybe actually bike i don't know to walmart or to vons where there's an actual you know uh actual path that you can go without having to um, take your life dodge in, cards. In, into your own hands <laughs> yeah um i mean there's there's multiple ways we can we can um achieve that but that's just one of the I also like to refer to our non-motorized plan, right? We have a published Mm -hmm. plan that's very helpful that at least has framework of what that can look like. Yeah, and really that's what all of this is, is just framework to try to tackle Mm -hmm. on these different different, um, goals. Mm -hmm. Um, So as far as... As far as increasing healthy food, one of the things that we did want to do was maybe work with either different organizations or the schools to try to bring more um, awareness to different types of food, Uh, maybe doing, um, informing people how you can grow your own food at your house. Um, I know people in the survey did ask to try to incorporate more community gardens. We've tried doing those in certain areas or groups have tried to do it in certain areas. Um, So maybe trying to get that back so people can grow either if they're not growing food at their own house, growing it at a dedicated um, area. So everything tied together would hopefully reduce our obesity rate and have people be more healthy. So I don't know if you guys had any other questions for me. Um, so along with this environmental justice element, then we're, we're able to apply for other grants that have specifically to do with environmental justice and, and also was this a grant that paid for the, the research and the, the presentation or was this just something that we were tasked with doing in coming up with the money on our own? Um, Gordon could probably better answer that question because I was just involved with doing the document. Okay. Um, he was more involved with applying for the um, grants. Right. Like I said, this was <clears throat> part of the SB2 grant, which uh, was the grant that did a lot of the preliminary uh, statistical housing element work. Um, like I said, this grant expires at the end of this year, so we need to claim that money, and this was one of the tasks, and they allocated $10,000 for this task. Even I think we probably spent way more than $10,000 on yeah. time to do it. Uh, that's why we, but we didn't do it when I get a consultant because we just didn't have money, extra money to do it. That, that's all they would allocate for us in the SB2 grant. Now the LEAP grant is the one that actually paid for the housing element itself and, uh, a a few more things that'll come up in the next uh, year or so to, to make some corrections in the zoning ordinance. So, um. Like I said, we did get some money out of it, and we, you know, we, on our timesheets, we put when we work on on certain grants, so we should be reimbursed uh, this full amount, uh, you know. But we have to show that we performed all the tasks, and one is adoption of the the actual. Element. Okay. And is that that makes us eligible for for more and better grants in the future? Yes, absolutely. Just like the housing element, like I said, this is a mandatory element now, mm-hmm. so. Like I say, it's one of those questions they ask, is your housing element up to date? Do you have an environmental justice? And, it, and it's not just for the things related to, you know, just like the housing element, it's, not, you know, it's for infrastructure. It's everything. They, they, they want you to be updated on everything. Yeah. yeah. Any state funding type yeah. thing usually has a box to check. Yeah, right. a, exactly. And like I said, the first time I've seen it was with the grant for uh, the, the roof for the, the Lions. Yes. We, uh, Mayor, we are having, experiencing difficulties with the audio on Facebook. Yes. It comes in and out, and we're still working on that. Okay. So I don't know currently if we're in or out, but it's been, it's been sporadic. Though, okay. So. Okay. okay. Thank you for that presentation, Andrea. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, you very much. All right. At this time, I will open the public hearing. And if there's any public comment regarding the environmental justice element. This is the time to make those comments or questions. 
Does the clerk have any comments? Anything online? Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no public comments or questions, I will close the public hearing. And I will look for any questions or comments from City Council. Well, I, I know it's a, it's a necessary element and we're going to have to adopt it. I know the senior citizens are working on a community garden and I think they're doing real well with that right now at the senior center. I think they've, they've been working on that for quite some time and I think it's coming together for them. So maybe we can duplicate some of that out there in the community if we, if we possibly could. I don't know, you know about our parks. We feel like we're kind of a little overwhelmed with our parks. We have so much. Um, I think we can encourage usage of those, but, uh, but I'm not sure that we can go a whole lot further on that. Um, I think it's a requirement that we have to put into place and we have to work towards it. I'm not sure, you know, how many years they give us and I'm not sure how much time they give us, but I think um, the environmental justice element, I think it is an important element because we do know we do have a disadvantaged population out there within the city. Absolutely. And, and to your point, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Couchman, uh, Community gardens, they don't necessarily have to be on public land. Uh, you know, if you've seen probably recently in places even as dense as New York and especially places like Detroit, uh, where there's a lot of vacant land now, uh, you know, there's a vacant parcel. Maybe that uh, there's a grant that would help to purchase it from somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't want to develop it into a house and then uh, have some kind of an organization, a neighborhood organization, then be uh, responsible for the upkeep of it and be able to grow their own food and vegetables and or, you know, just a little area to go and sit if they don't have a very big yard or anything. Or they, if they live in an apartment or something and they don't have a yard, they can, you know, have use of this. So. Thanks. Very good. Yeah, um, you know, I just, uh, I wasn't shocked to see this information. It's, uh, it's pretty obvious when we walk out and... Uh, see what our town looks like. I would love to see uh, we can put together together workshops in each specific area, and get members of the community to see what they're in, get their input and see how we can improve uh, the areas for them so they can walk and ride their bikes. Because even in the winter, even right now, just the way the sun is and we don't, you know, without shaded areas, it's, you know, it's most people don't want to do it. Um, you know, as well as, um, you know, they need to have access to information and and be more educated as far as their diets and whatnot. I mean, if we could do some of that, it'd be great. But I would love to see some workshops, yeah. um, and I would love to participate in them. Sure. Um, yeah. And and you know, there's so many other uh, you know other uh, community organizations that mm -hmm. that can be involved in this. Mm -hmm. You know that that uh, you know would help out. Uh, and yeah, that that's an excellent idea. Yeah, specifically excellent. 104. If we right. can look at that area, I would love to be involved sure. in that area, which just seems to be the, the most disadvantage of the four. Most disadvantage, correct. Thank you. <clears throat> we do have some really nice parks, especially Cattle Call Park. I mean, it's a great yes. place to, to bike and jog. And there are trees. And we've yeah. made, we've made yeah, improvements. But like at, I said, at, for, for, for the people that live on the most disadvantaged side... But, yeah, exactly. They have to get there. Right. right. You know. Alice Giroux is a nice, Alice Giroux, is a nice right. park in 104. Significant right. improvements with walking oh, yeah, yeah. areas, you know, Hosa's walking area right. as well. Right. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements yeah. to, to some of the areas that have been disadvantaged for decades. Yeah, it's certainly right. gotten so, much better over Oh, yeah. no, it's, it's definitely years. gotten Not better. only that, even, but yeah. you've you got to consider the definitely. fire station, um, you know, right in, in that area. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. So. There, there are things, obviously, I don't want people um, leaving with the impression that things aren't changing because yeah. they have. You know, right? and, and we want to get some commercial, you know, uh, other, you know, uh, I know like uh, there, there's there been, you know, uh, some speculation on a grocery store possibly at the corner of uh, uh, Best Avenue and, and Main Street that can serve the east side, you know, something right. a similar size yeah. of like, like Vons that mm -hmm. has, you know, not just a limited uh, uh, amount of, of food that that's you know unhealthy right, right, right. right. yeah yeah you know yeah not with not, more, not selection just, and more selection and that has more selection and things so you know those are things that, that kind of things that we yeah. want to encourage with this this absolutely. these kind of policies that absolutely are in here. right there's no other questions I'll make a motion to approve the item okay I'll second that it's been moved and seconded yeah. to approve and adopt the environmental justice element did, did we close the public hearing? Yeah, I closed okay. it, and this right. was just uh, council go. comments. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? <clears throat> all right, the environmental justice element carries. <clears throat> Thank you, Gordon. 
Item 5B, discussion and potential action to adopt first reading of ordinance number 2021-, ordinance of the City Council of the City of Brawley, California, adopting the mandatory California Organic Recycling Program. This will be presented by our Public Works Director, Guillermo Cias. Backup is on pages 71 through 98. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, Guillermo Sillas, Public Works Director. As uh, stated by the Mayor, this item is uh, in regards to the uh, adoption of mandatory California Organic Recycling Program. This uh, item includes several uh, elements uh, and uh, laws that were passed by the State of California throughout the years. And it's a complex in, in, in nature, and uh, we have invited um, uh, various uh, guest speakers to explain and to answer questions that you might have. At this point, I would like to introduce Mr. Steven Mireles, which is the Senior Environmental Compliance Officer, to give us a little bit more uh, detailed information and introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Guillermo. <clears throat> Thank you, um, uh, City Manager, Mayor, and, and <clears throat> members of the Council. Um, again, my name is Steven Mireles. I'm the Senior Environmental Compliance Officer for the City. Uh, and today I'd like to um, briefly introduce uh, some of the individuals that are here to speak to us about SB 1383 and a series of other laws. Um, back on, in June 15th, 2021, in, our, in the City Council meeting uh, on that day, I did provide a presentation in regards to SB 1383 uh, and a compliant, uh, a compliant ordinance that the city has been working on to uh, 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 come into compliance with that law. Uh, I spoke towards uh, not only the laws that were passed, but also our franchise agreement with Republic Services, which hauls our solid waste. Uh, and, it also, and we also detailed uh, the programs that SB 1383 compliant ordinance will require us in regards to organic recycling, edible food management, and composting. So kind of uh, in terms of what Andrea just brought up in, in environmental justice uh, element, uh, this law also is um, aiming towards uh, addressing food insecurity. And so uh, it is a state mandate uh, from Sacramento. And, uh, and so it is something that all cities within the state of California are required to comply with. Today, uh, we are going to have a presentation by Cal Recycle and Republic Services. Um, currently, again, the city is regulated by the state agency Cal Recycle, and Republic Services is here to speak towards uh, the haulers' efforts to meet these requirements as well. Uh, from Cal Recycle, we have Jill uh, Larner and Haley Amiller uh, here to speak to us. And then on Zoom, I know we're having some issues with uh, audio with the Zoom, but we also have Kara Morgan uh, from LAMD, Branch Chief. Uh, and then with Republic Service, uh, we have George Taylor. So um, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Haley. All right, um, hopefully Kara can hear everything okay. <laughs> but good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thanks for inviting us this evening to speak on SB 1383. As Stephen said, my name is Haley Amiller. I'm the Local Assistance and Market Development Liaison for the City. And Jill Larner is my supervisor. She is here too. And our branch manager, Kara Morgan, is here to answer questions at the end of the presentation, should you have any. This presentation provides a very high-level overview for the requirements for compliance with 1383 uh, to complement the ordinance that I've spoken about. So, next slide. Why is 1383 important? Um, organic waste comprises half of California's disposed waste stream, and food waste comprises 13% of the state's disposed waste. Uh, this is happening while so many Californians go hungry every night in California. And um, I recall in the previous presentation for the environmental justice, food insecurity is an issue in this region, and parts of this regulation will assist with that problem. Um, next slide. 
Another important reason that this is so important is to fight against climate change. SB 1383 passed in 2016 as part of California's larger strategy to combat climate change, and the law was designed to reduce uh, global warming super pollutants like methane, which is up to 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Landfills are one of the three largest producers of methane in the state, and when organic material breaks down in the landfill, methane is generated. So it's important that we need to move away from landfilling organic waste, like food, paper, and yard waste. Next slide. SB 1383 is a statewide target that requires California to reduce organic waste disposal by 75% on the state level and increase edible food recovery by 20% by 2025. Organic waste is defined broadly in the regulations, and it includes food waste, paper, cardboard, green waste, organic textiles and carpets, lumber, wood, biosolids, digestate, manure, and sludges. And while the regulations take effect in 2022, which is coming up, jurisdictions have to plan now so that they can be in compliance by January 2022. Next slide. So there are many benefits um, if we successfully implement California's super pollutant reduction strategy, including the environmental benefits such as fighting climate change, improved air quality, uh, which was also mentioned in the environmental justice presentation, and less landfilled waste, providing millions of meals to Californians with not enough food to eat, and creating thousands of new green jobs. Next slide. Um, here are some key implementation dates throughout the rulemaking process. Uh, it was a long road. The most important dates to note are that the regulations become enforceable in January 1st, 2022. This means that starting in January, jurisdictions must have their programs in place and CowRecycle can begin enforcement actions on jurisdictions and other entities. Um, in 2024, jurisdictions will be required to take enforcement action on non-compliant entities. Next slide. Uh, this slide provides a brief overview of the program requirements that jurisdictions will be required to adequately staff and resource. We will cover briefly some of these requirements on the next few slides, and I'll go over some of them right here. So jurisdictions will be required to provide organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses. And this is what we refer to as automatic service or universal service. Uh, the resident or business is automatically provided the service rather than subscribing to it. And the regulations standardize uh, container colors across the state to avoid <coughs> confusion um, and require a jurisdiction to place a label on each new container or lid provided to generators. Um, jurisdictions or their hauler must monitor containers for contamination and jurisdictions can issue three types of waivers to generators, de minimis, physical space, or collection frequency. The regulations also place requirements on residents and commercial businesses. Another requirement, jurisdictions must conduct annual education and outreach to all generators. This includes information on methods for the prevention of organic waste generation, recycling organic waste <coughs> on site, and sending organic waste to community composting. Uh, this also includes information regarding programs for the donation of edible food. Haley, can I stop yeah. you there for a second? Sure. We need to take a brief recess to reset Zoom because we're having okay. sound issues. Having some difficulties with it. So we will just take a recess until until Armando says we're back in business. Should okay. should be just a couple Sorry about that. <laughs> I know. I'll go. Right. She's like taking a breath. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> What's up? We have to repeat all that. Yeah. You can start from slide one again, please. Yeah. 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 Well, let's go back to consent. Let's go back to consent. Please. Okay. Um, we went over jurisdictions must conduct annual education and outreach. They must also procure certain levels of recovered organic waste products, and that includes compost, renewable gas, or electricity from biomass conversion. Each jurisdiction will have a minimum procurement target that is linked to the city's population. Um, there are requirements to purchase recycled content paper and paper products if price and performance is comparable, and CowRecycle will be notifying jurisdictions of their target prior to January 1st, 2022, so we will keep you apprised of that. 
Um, each jurisdiction must plan for adequate capacity and recycling organic waste and edible food recovery. And each county will lead this effort by coordinating with cities, special districts that provide solid waste collection services, and regional agencies located within the county. Next slide. SB 1383 extends beyond your waste management and recycling operations and staff. So this slide shows that every department within local government will be affected and have a role to play. Each department will need to understand how SB 1383 impacts their work. Jurisdictions should be thinking and planning for the staffing they will need, what responsibilities department staff will have, whether they will task their direct service providers to staff some activities, and whether they will contract with other entities such as environmental health inspectors or consultants. Next slide. <clears throat> Jurisdictions are responsible to implement edible food recovery programs in their communities. This includes providing education and outreach, assessing capacity of existing edible food recovery and expanding existing infrastructure if necessary to meet the needs of commercial edible food generators that are located in your jurisdiction, conducting inspections of tier one commercial edible food generators and food recovery organizations and services beginning in 2022, and adding inspections of tier two commercial edible food generators beginning January 1st, 2024. And there is guidance documents um, on how to identify those tier one and tier two. Um, SB 1383 related inspections of food recovery organizations and food recovery services will be limited to verifying that the record keeping requirements have been met. Inspections should be at a level or rate that is sufficient to adequately determine compliance with the requirements and annual inspections of each tier one and tier two commercial edible food generator is not required. Beginning in 2024, jurisdictions must take enforcement action on commercial edible food generators that are out of compliance with the edible food recovery requirements. Next slide. Okay. By January 1st, 2022, jurisdictions are required to have an enforcement mechanism or ordinance in place, and that is what we are here to elaborate on today that Stephen is bringing up. Between January 2022 and December 2023, jurisdictions need to identify businesses in violation of the regulatory requirements and provide educational material to those generators. Beginning in January 2024, jurisdictions must take progressive enforcement action against organic waste generators that are not in compliance. Cow Recycle sets a maximum time frame that a jurisdiction has to issue a notice of violation and issue penalties to a generator and the jurisdiction has flexibility to develop its own enforcement process within these parameters. Um, an early robust education program will minimize the amount of enforcement that is needed, and if the jurisdiction is automatically providing service to its residents and commercial businesses, then this further minimizes the need for enforcement action. To reduce reporting, Jurisdictions are required to maintain records and keep information in an implementation record. Um, each jurisdiction is required to report to the department annually on its implementation and compliance with the requirements. Next slide. This is a long slide, so prepare. In the case of entities as public universities, school districts, federal facilities, which are exempt from local solid waste oversight, Cow Recycle will be directly responsible for ensuring compliance. Mm -hmm. However, the jurisdictions are required to provide education and outreach to these entities. Cow Recycle will be evaluating a jurisdiction's compliance and will be establishing a process for conducting jurisdiction compliance evaluations. SB 1383, again, is a statewide target and not a jurisdiction organic waste diversion target. The department has included some aspects of flexibility in enforcement um, of the regulation that are similar to the AB 939 good faith effort requirements, but are tailored more to the different nature of the SB 1383 requirements. Under the regulations, if Cow Recycle determines a jurisdiction is violating one or more of the requirements, 
Cower Cycle will provide a uh, compliance assistance, such as checklists, model tools, and training. Although Cower Cycle may begin penalty enforcement on regulated entities starting in January 2022, the timeline for enforcement process is not triggered until California issues a notice of violation, an NOV. Um, once Cower Cycle determines enforcement actions or penalties are necessary, Cower Cycle will implement the process outlined in SB 1383, and the regulations include a compliance review and enforcement process that allows for extended timelines for jurisdictions under certain circumstances to come into compliance before penalties are issued. And penalties are imposed as a last resort after all other compliance actions have failed. Um, one more thing, under SB 619, there is an authorization, a local jurisdiction facing continuing violations that commence during the 2022 calendar year to submit to Cower Cycle no later than March 1st, 2022, a notification of intent to comply for some or all of the regulatory requirements. Cower Cycle is conducting a statewide webinar on SB 619 this Thursday from 9 to 10, so more information will be available on that regulation later. And I sent out additional information on that webinar this morning to Stephen Morales, and he can provide that to you if you wish to attend. Next slide. A little bigger. <laughs> oh, she just wanted to face? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> This is the good slide. Okay. Finally, I'd like to mention that as part of the governor's $15 billion climate package, Cower Cycle was provided $105 million uh, for organic infrastructure grants and $60 million for grants to local jurisdictions to assist in the implementation of SB 1383. This funding is great news for facilities and jurisdictions in California. And I also provided more information on that to Stephen this morning, um, along with, uh, and he can provide that to you. Are, are those uh, competitive grants? No. They're not? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good anyway. And next slide. That's the end of the presentation. Thanks for your time. And um, if you have any questions, I believe Kara is here now and can hear us. Kara? <laughs> Are you with us? Are you with us? It doesn't sound Knocked like two it. times. <laughs> oh, like she's here. Right. I have a question. I don't know if you can answer it or if it has to be Kara, but what is edible food recovery? It sounds scary to me. <laughs> so um, I can probably take a crack at that. That's not regulation it's food that can be taken um from like grocery stores and stuff and redistributed to people for people to eat it's not like a half-eaten sandwich okay. that you're taking from someone's hands and giving to someone else it is sellable food that you are redistributing to like food banks and that kind yes. of stuff okay. Mm -hmm. okay so not expired no okay it is um well I'm not going to get to Kara can get more technical about it, but um, it is edible, proper food with the health department that can be redistributed. Okay, all right. Yeah. We do Don't some of worry. It already, I think. <laughs> is there an idea of of what percentage of <clears throat> of food in in facilities like that, grocery stores or restaurants or whatever, would be could be saved or could be redistributed? There is a percentage, and there are statistics on that. I don't um, have those on me right now. Maybe Kara has that information. Trippy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that would be nice to know because uh, I, can, I can hear for the moment. Oh, we can okay. hear you now too. Oh, okay. See you. Can actually see you. You're back. Thank you, council members, for having us here tonight. Uh, you know, to answer your question, we do have some estimates by different generators. So we do have an estimate um, for supermarkets as to the amount of 
edible food that could typically be recovered. So there, there is some, uh, some data on that. Okay. Um, is, is, this, is this heavier on the climate change side than it is on the food recovery side, would you say? Do you mean? Are the, are, the, are the regulations that are being put in place more to combat climate change or to combat food insecurity? I mean, with the percentage of food that can be recovered from different facilities, is that the focus of this of of this law, or is it is climate change more the focus of the law? It definitely, climate change is the focus. It is part of um, you know the, the state's um, approach to dealing with short-lived climate pollutants and um, you know climate change in general. However, the societal benefits, um, as well as the the uh, climate benefits from recovering edible food, are very significant. You know, just last year, um, we estimate that we disposed of approximately 1.8 billion meals. Um, this is based on statistics of how much we actually cover, recovered, and some, some data and statewide characterization. So I heard in the earlier presentation of environmental justice, I think there's a tremendous opportunity um, for the city of Raleigh in implementing its edible food program. To, to be able to really meet some of those needs of um, you know members of the community. So um, I also, I, I think uh, uh, Haley noted on the slide, the edible food grant program, uh, grant cycle is currently open. And this would be something I would strongly encourage um, city council to consider applying for. It is a, a short cycle to do the first round of the application. Um, and that and I think applications are due the, the uh, middle of December. I don't remember if it's the 14th or 16th. Uh, but I think there's tremendous opportunity to recover edible food um, in the community. Okay. Any other questions on the presentation before we open the public hearing? Well, we have one more presentation with uh, Republic. Before before we open the public, I hearing. would I would suggest, but it's, of course it's up to you. Okay. And in case there's questions, <laughs> okay. the public hearings. Yeah, and maybe as if we transition to that, I might be more of a comment. I do have some questions that um, I could not glean out of at least the way our um, first reading here is, is is drafted. But there is a lot here, and I, I I'm going to just say myself, I haven't been a huge fan of this from the beginning. So we have been briefed. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm not the only council member in the state of California that has that feeling. But um, again, I, I, that's wonderful. There's a grant program, but I still um, have a lot of questions about how those impacts. I mean, all I heard was content on enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to know, what are the estimates of how this program is ultimately going to be funded based on violations, based on fines, based on enforcement actions that are going to be, I, I, what, I, what I saw was charged to us as a city. Um, and then if we don't do what we're doing, it sounds an awful lot like some of the other um, boards and governing uh, committees and agencies that in the past have fined us. And it, it punitive, just, punitive yeah. fines. I mean, to right. me, I, I, I just feel it's, it, it's all part and parcel why there's probably been a, a, a well-noted exodus out of this state. So I've got to answer to at least our constituents is what are these impacts? Because I can't answer those questions. You know, and telling them there's a grant we can apply for is, is a little concerning to me. So are there numbers to help jurisdictions like us on what is the cost to implement? And the other thing I'd like to know, are there other states that have implemented similar mandates, unfunded mandates, and how's their success been, or are we on the leading edge of this? That's, those are my questions. And I know it's too late, it's already passed, and it's being implemented, but I, th 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 those have been my questions. So I'm just curious, just at a high level, are there other states? And has anything like this ever been done before on such a wide level? I think Kara missed most of that because the sound was off, yeah? I did, but uh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just respond, and, and Council Member, maybe you can provide any additional information. Um, absolutely correct. This is the first um, state um, in the U.S. to um, uh, really develop something as comprehensive as this. Um, we are seeing other states are now um, have either uh, started to uh, implement similar 
um, types of programs or are you know, uh, considering. So it's definitely something that's taking shape across the United States. I might, if I may. Go ahead, sir. I, I don't mind the implementation of programs. What I do mind is when we're fined $10,000 for every violation that occurs on a daily basis, when we're considered to be a poor or a relatively low income area. So basically what it does is, is you have this requirement and then you have to abide by this requirement or else the city gets funded, which means the taxpayer gets funded because that's where all the money comes from. So you've got low income people paying taxes and then they're being fined $10,000 a day by the state and that money's leaving the county or leaving the city, and those people aren't benefiting at all. And so one of the problems that I see is is that it's nice to, to put the carrot out there and then beat you with the stick, but, but what do we ultimately get out of this? Uh, my concern is I think if you do a voluntary-type program and people voluntarily comply and you do the best you can with that, I think that might be the way to go in some of the communities that we have because what happens is is the, the punishment begins to be more important than the actual program. The program itself. And, and so Certainly. that's my concern. So typically, that's what we see. And I've seen that for the last, I've been in governmental service now for 40 plus years. And I've seen that through the whole process at the county level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And then I noticed on one of the slides, the feds aren't required to comply, so they can do whatever they want in, in the city, the and they don't have to comply with the ordinance, but with the city, I mean with the state law, but so the feds can do whatever they want, and so then the state punitively punishes the city. And we get punished because somebody out there in the public is not obeying. And so, and then we have to deal with that, and so then we have to punish them, and then people tell us we're not business friendly, or we're, or we're not, or, or we're charging them too much for city services, or we're doing all of those types of things. And so I have some concerns with that. Those are my questions that I have. Nobody can really answer those. I'm, I'm not faulting any of, of the people here in this room or on, or, or on the video. I just, I just, I find that very frustrating to me in my 13 years of being here on the city council and on my 35 years of working for the county, it seems like this is the way it always goes. And I'm not sure we're any better off because of that. Yeah, I and agree. So that's my concern. It's when why you think, people are leaving the state. Right, that's right. One I mean, of, you one look many at the, reasons. the yeah. hundreds and hundreds of communities throughout the state. You mean to tell me everybody's going to be complying? They're not, you know? And so it's like, how much money is that going to be, you know, collected in fines and implement? You know, it's just implementation costs and things of that nature. It's just, in my opinion, it's outrageous. You know, and so now we put greater um, uh, emphasis on a city to take care of these issues, and it's just it's mandated on us without really any financial support, right. other than like, you know, okay, we're going to give you sixty million dollars to make some flyers and educate people. Like, come yeah. on, I mean, that's just, I mean, and I'm exaggerating the point, but I'm making the point in that that's what is being funded essentially, right? right? right. Education. Yeah. Well, it's your fault. You didn't educate them. Right. Like we, we provided the funds for it. <laughs> that's like now we're responsible for creating that program, getting it out yeah. there, and, 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 and still, you know, ultimately and it's I, our responsibility. I highly doubt, yeah, after reading all the material, it is very complex. There is a right. lot to this. I mean, how can you expect our business community, for example, food services, to even understand as many times as you think it's been talked about um, the nuances and, and really some of the, you know, inflection points that are, that are built into the, you know, this law. So I, I, I'm just, you know, it was very clear to me that the violations were very red and white, you know, as it was presented, um, but the implementation was very gray and opaque, in my opinion. And, and I do think we make an effort right now with the canned. We have, we have our, our, our trash collection system is pretty good. We have the black can, the green can, and the blue can, and people tend to, but I know they don't always comply with that. I mean, I know people don't always put everything in the right container, and then we have people scrounging in the containers for different things, and we try to enforce that from a law enforcement side, but that's even difficult to do. And so I, I don't know how you're gonna operate this in that fashion. The other thing is we're asking stores to recycle re edible food, but are people gonna go buy the product if they can get it for free later on, if they don't go and buy the product, then we run into those kinds of issues. So I think it's, 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 it's not just an implementation of a law, it's a cultural and a thought change by the members of the public and by all of us that have lived 
in this society for as long as we have. It's, it's an actual cultural change. It and is. I'm not sure that'll happen in, by 2022. Yeah. And not okay. only that, but in our community, let's face that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's like we're, we're, we're so different than other parts of the country. Yes. You know, our education levels, our every, everything, right? Yes. Socioeconomic levels, all these other issues that we face, are Absolutely. faced with. And so, anyway. So I have some major concerns. Maybe they won't be mine to address for the yeah. future, yeah. but I do have some major concerns. I'll leave, good points. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments uh, for Calvary Cycle, we'll ask uh, Republic to come up. Yeah, you won't be yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. It's hey, hard we to always love when you come up here and talk trash. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's, always, it's always, always good uh, to hear from you. Great. Yeah. You get to follow. Mayor and Council Members, just a, before my friend from Republic speaks, uh, you know, just a couple of things. First of all, I really appreciate all of the comments. I know this is a big lift for this city. What I do appreciate, however, and, and I do want to clarify, federal facilities are um, obligated and mm -hmm. have a very specific requirements in the regulations and Cal Recycle will be enforcing mm -hmm. on these entities Correct. rather than the city. So I just wanted to clarify I guess that. that's a good thing. We're clarify still responsible for educating them, right? The yeah. is in a very good yeah. position right. with this program. I think as council member said, you know, you already have a very robust collection program. And, and so when we talk about the enforcement arm of this, the city of Raleigh is in a very great position, you know, with your, your partner with Republic and the services that Republic already provides. So, you know, I'm really anticipating there really should be little to no need for enforcement action from 2024 because your residents and your businesses are being provided this service. And when it comes to edible food collection, you know, we're seeing supermarkets and businesses across the state in poor communities and, and not poor communities that are really interested in participating in this program. So thank you for allowing me to, to share um, those thoughts. Okay. Thanks, Kara. Okay. <laughs> You're up. Uh, Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, my name is George Taylor. I am a uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful name and beautiful hairstyle. Thank friend. you. Thank you very much. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> thank you much. Um, I'm the new operations manager with Republic Services. I've uh, been here now s almost six months, and uh, a lot's going on. And as um, Haley was mentioning, um, you know, a, a lot of this has to do with sustainability. And uh, as you can see in the third column over there, sustainability is what uh, Republic's, is in Republic's DNA. One of the things, as you can uh, barely make out, is the lower uh, portion of that says 50% reduction uh, by 2030 in, uh, uh, or, or having uh, biogas uh, uh, beneficial reuse. Um, and so this diversion program, so to speak, or recycling program of organics fits right into uh, what we're trying to do as a company. Oops. Okay. Uh, as our program, uh, what we're talking about as our program uh, gets implemented, uh, first of all, um, you know, we can't do anything without council approval, right? And so we have provided staff with uh, cost estimates, numbers, and um, we've actually looked at uh, easing the program in so that we can get participation from the, from the city residents. And what I mean by easing the, 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 the program in is we have a general idea of what the cost of the program is going to be based on what our costs are, uh, and what we've looked at at other company, other facilities in other cities, Chula Vista being one, uh, San Diego being another. Uh, so we've looked at their cost structure, we've looked at our cost structure, and we have an idea of what the cost of this program is going to be. What we've thought about doing or what we are going to do is um, subsidize that cost uh, going forward in 2022 uh, so that we can get a real idea of what uh, the true cost of of processing green waste and organics together. And it's uh, never less. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. It won't it's be less. less. It probably yeah. won't be. Um, it just but, but, isn't. But, but no, 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 you, you no. are correct, Councilman. Mm -hmm. uh, we have looked at it, but what we are trying to do is our best guess in trying to minimize the cost to the residents mm -hmm. and the community. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, when we look at the program, um, we are actually taking waste out of the, our landfills. 
uh, as, as Haley was mentioning, uh, we're taking uh, the same program that we have with the three cart system. Uh, we're going to take the combined food waste with the, or, um, with the uh, green waste and take that material over to our compost facility in uh, Welton, Arizona. Uh, we currently are operating um, the uh, first ever uh, solar composting facility in our San Diego facility. Uh, and at some point in time, we may be able to, be able to push our, our volume over there. But at this point, we just don't have enough volume to make it feasible to go over there. Just a trash science question. Sure. But um, the reference was made about the production of methane gas mm -hmm. in our landfills, right? right? By moving it all and obviously consolidating in a composting facility, is the same methane gas being released into the environment? Uh, no, it isn't because uh, where the methane where, where the methane gas comes from is compaction of the waste. Okay. So as you as you push the waste down, it it creates the gases. We won't be doing that when we compost. Um, and, uh, as we move forward, uh, one of the things that, um, that uh, you know, we have talked about is a partnership. Uh, IVRMA is here, Cal Recycle. And so uh, along with that, what we have done is already invested in, in a recycling coordinator. Uh, the, the, the task is that important. So as the, um, I, I heard a number of uh, times, there is a, quite a bit of reporting that is required. Um, we're going to try and take on that for our, our jurisdictions, uh, and that's why we've, we've already hired that position uh, uh, that will be starting as of December 7th. Uh, so we will work in conjunction and try and alleviate some of the pain uh, that the city will uh, experience, as, as you talked about uh, earlier. Uh, composting. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, you talked about, uh, are other cities doing this? Um, uh, we are ex uh, noticing that other um, communities, other states are doing it, but it is not a mandatory requirement at this point. So one of the things that, that, that we've talked about is making sure that um, it, it, for this program to be successful, we've got to make it simple and convenient. Uh, one of the things you see up, up top there is a countertop pail uh, where you can collect your organics before you, uh, you transfer them to the larger green waste container. Uh, of course, that one says Republic. Yeah, you can use any any pail, but uh, you, you know we'll never miss that opportunity to put Republic on something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what can you what can you, uh, uh, you put in a green container? Obviously, all food waste, as was, was talked about beforehand, uh, all green waste, um, you know, brushes, limbs. Uh, we try and stay away from palm fronds. We know they're uh, 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 big out here, uh, but the problem with that is is uh, when we go to grind the material. Uh, it gets caught up in the in the machines. And we not saying that we can't do it. Um, we can process anything, uh, but the cleaner the material, uh, the cheaper we can keep that cost. Uh, what we can't do, uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry if you had a question. Uh, no. I was just going to say what we can't do is 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 contaminate the waste, right? And so what you see on the other side of this slide is is what isn't um, uh, part of the the organics uh, or food waste program. And that is, um, you know, plastic bags, uh, you know, paper plates, uh, pizza boxes, things of that nature. Uh, we have a facility that can handle plastic bags. Uh, it's in our Anaheim facility where they slit the bag and the, the, the material drops out of the bag. Again, it's volume related. Um, you know, they're handling all of L.A.'s volume. Um, and, and we just don't have the volume in order to invest in that at this particular time. Again, as the volume grows, we may be able to, 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 to transship that material somewhere else and uh, lower the cost at that point. So is that that's different from what um, was presented just earlier on, on some of the, the – under the cannot? I, my understanding was the um, paper products that come in contact with foods would be eligible for – collection or segregation into these yeah so so it can go it, to yeah. answer your question yes you it can go into this material but, but it makes the, it the, makes the composting tougher i right? would imagine yeah, yeah so so as we want that material as clean as possible um, so as you introduce paper products into that material, it makes it tougher because we can't uh, – we're trying to get it to the point where we can sell it as uh, food acceptable or plant acceptable compost. It has to be fairly clean now, in order to – If we to don't do that, will we be in violation yeah. of that right. – of this uh, law? The – my we're, we're not in compliance. We're going to have to pay. <laughs> my understanding is no in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that, um, one, you will have a program – uh, to you, we would be uh, diverting some percentages of it, and, and I haven't seen the, the percentages that uh, Cal Recycle was requesting, uh, but you're also diverting recycling material. 
Okay, but that's, that's... But it doesn't have to be in the green container. It can go in the blue container if it's clean. And, uh, and you would plan for... See, it's clear as mud. Co correct. <laughs> Co correct. Um, the, the, the one thing that, and I'll try and, and, and clear up what, what we thought it was. Um, if there is paper products, cardboard, things of that nature, we already have a recycling program for that. But if there's food stuck to it, that was my impression reading the, you know, the material, and that's part of the confusing part, that it is now qualified as, or now defined, I read the definitions in here, as a, a, a food waste. Mm -hmm. Hence, we would be in violation if that were, let's say, mistakenly put into either the blue or the black container. Uh, right. So, so what we can do, and, and I'll have to clarify that. I'll have to get that clarified. Um, but what we can do is we can p use that as part of the diversion program. If you're putting it in the green waste container, it's yeah. going to go away. Now, yeah. on our other end in, in Copper Mountain yeah. composting facility, we have folks cleaning that material. Okay. Right. So it's you... We're able to teach people to lick their plates clean. And then it's like, <laughs> like George That does. would be easier, probably, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> I already do that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's, it. You wouldn't be fine. <laughs> I'm not worried about right. that. <laughs> so so um, we will have to clarify that. Uh, we, uh, the, 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 the jurisdiction would meet the requirements as long as the, that material is leaving the is, is in the green waste container. Now, what we would do with it, once we, it gets to our composting, facility is, is we would clean it out. It re meets the requirement of Cal Recycle because it is leaving the landfill or not going into the landfill. At our facility, we are now making it, uh, in Arizona, we're now making it um, a cleaner compost. So um, uh, to answer your original question yeah. and, to, and to correspond with, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Cal Recycle is yeah. it can go in there. We'll just have to clean it out. Yeah. Ultimately, it's either, either enforcement that costs money or or increased costs for uh, disposal uh, uh, is what uh, it's going to come down to. what I understood a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. So, so again, um, as, as I heard earlier, um, uh, part of the program and the success of the program um, is education. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, um, we have invested in a, uh, a community liaison uh, that will work with the uh, other agencies and the jurisdictions um, in order to educate the, the community uh, with community events, social media, uh, presentations, uh, community, any, all, all, all sorts of community outreach. Um, so uh, I believe in the in the. Uh, in Stephen's uh, uh, information, we will still work with our three cart system, right? And, and um, we're currently with the black, the green, and the blue. Um, in the future, however, we we want to still keep that 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 system, but we would like to go to a point where we have the base the same color, right? And so that the uh, differentiator will be the lid itself. Mm -hmm. So we will go with a blue container, uh, which. I, as I read, it was 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 okay. Uh, we will go to the blue container with the um, uh, the black, the green, and the and the blue lid. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, so um, as this program uh, gets rolled out, um, one of the things uh, is as is we are already set to roll it out to the business community. Um, <coughs> Sorry, missed the slide there. We're, we're already set to roll it out uh, to the business community. Uh, and what we will do initially for the business community, as uh, space is sometimes an issue uh, and we can't handle plastic <clears throat> bags, um, we will um, provide containers, an additional green container to commercial and multi -home, uh, multi-family homes uh, in order for them to uh, tailor this process. So as you see in the picture, uh, there are no plastic bags there. There's a small pail of food waste. She's dumping it in the container itself. What we will do with that container is pick it up on a weekly or a more frequent basis and exchange that container with a clean container, take those contain containers, wash and sterilize those, and then bring those back when we, when we come back. So <laughs> So oh, crazy! <laughs> there, there will, oh, yeah, it's getting better all the time. There will never be. Uh, hopefully, there's not a plastic bag. Hopefully, um, uh, at this point, we're picking it up more as uh, on a, and a more frequent basis, so that it, it does not commit any issues with odor uh, or any vector issues. Uh, and so, um, that's our game plan right now. Um, we'd like to get to the point where we can Probably we can get a, a much larger container uh, if the business require it. Um, but it, it initially, what we'll do is have multiple containers uh, for any businesses that have additional volume. 
you know, the, I'm going to bring up a topic. It's it's off subject a little bit, but it's related, right? Sure. It happened uh, last night. Somebody broke into my property, took one of the containers, again. right? Again, right? And so took my neighbor's container. I went out to the recycling center. I found them and uh, was able to address it. But I found where, where the guy lived, and he had like 30 containers in his house. So it, it, we're going to have issues like that where people are, are taking these things and they're going to um, – you know, cause havoc and make a mess. And so, but then we become responsible for cleaning it up, whether it's at our properties or other things, right? This particular person happened to be stealing. That was the second trash can he stolen from me. But this time he jumped over the fence, stole it, stole my neighbors. And um, I was able to go out and I knew where he would be. Hmm. So I took a little bit of my own enforcement action. I did get assistance from Brawley PD later. Okay. But um, my point is, you're going to have issues with people that steal these things, right? And they take them. And this guy happened to have about 30 of them in his backyard. Why? So, what did why? He say? No, because he's taking them to, to recycle ah. cans and then he dumps them, right? Got it. And Got so it. he's he stealing them. He's stealing them, right? And it's some junky hype, you know? And so, and I know he is, so I don't mind saying it in public, but. I'm, I, I know he is, you know, and so, um, but we're going to have these issues, right? And so nobody thinks of all the other issues that we have to deal with as a city. Nobody thinks it's so all of these mandates and all, you know, you have waste for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. You think you're not going to have like rodents out yeah. there the and other time? issues? Exactly. In the oh summer. My goodness. Can you imagine? You know, nobody degrees, considers those things. You know, whoever's Sacramento. writing these things is out in the Bay Area yeah. in a nice AC <laughs> building and not here. Tell them to spend some time in Brawley. You know, yeah. and this isn't directed at you, yeah. but it is yeah. it is a concern that I have because it's true. True. Right. Nobody is doing this out here. Have them come out here in the summer. I remember one time we applied for a grant. I swear to you, this happened. They came out for a grant, and it was somebody from way out of town, and they came in the middle of summer. They wouldn't even get out of the car to go look <laughs> at the park because it was so hot. And it's like, you know, that's what we're faced with. That's not a reality of where they're at, right? But anyway, I'll go on in a rant. I just wanted to bring up the waste container issue because it just occurred, and you know, I, I'm hoping that there's a way that you're able to collect those back because obviously he's sitting on $3,500 worth of, of your toters. You know what I mean? Would love and, to. Would yeah, love to, but, yes. But you see what I'm saying? But that happens throughout this city. All right. And, and we're just brawly. We're one little... Yeah. Well, we're one little community. Yeah. You have tons of communities just like us, you know? But anyway, my, my rant's over, but it's, um, I do want to thank Brawley PD for helping me out today, though. And uh, I appreciate them. And, uh, but anyway. So I, I just yeah. want to make it, make it clear that, um, you know, we are trying to uh, partner with the city. No, absolutely. Right? I, I, I consider you one. Yeah. So, and you, you've been good to us, and I appreciate that. But my, my, my concern is not you. It's everything else that's mandated on us as a community. Mm -hmm. That, quite frankly, it's what I said. It's people that aren't familiar with our community that do this, right? And it's like they put all these mandates on us, but they don't live here, right? They're not the ones that are having to deal with this. They don't have to live in the summers that we have to suffer through. They don't see the poverty that's out here. They don't see all the issues that we have to deal with, but it's a mandate they put on us like, oh, no, this would be good for the environment or good for whatever, or good for the landfills. But, but yet New River and right. Salton Sea, but they don't address those address. issues. We won't touch that. Right? Yeah, that's too big. So, yeah, but no, you pick all this crap up, and if somebody makes a mess, pick that up too. I was like, come on, man. But anyway, I'll, I'll go on all night. I forgot my wig today, so it's like I need a hug. You know what I mean? So, all right. Right, there you go. <laughs> a little bit. Go ahead. Anyway, yeah, I, uh, thank, thank you, Councilman. I, um, I, I'm done with my presentation. I just wanted to, if there are any questions, anything. I could have waited uh, two, two, uh, 30 seconds. Yeah. I'm sorry. Do you no have worries, a... Uh, no worries. a Timeline for that rollout, uh, especially. I'm looking forward to the little bucket, yeah, the little Republic bucket. on them. Like there you go. Uh, yeah, I was thinking how we the best the way that we can sort of sort it out at home and start educating my family on how to do this. And the little buckets seem real cool. It might be kind of nasty, but um, yeah, I mean, we, we now put it in a plastic bag and just dump it out, right? But we'll figure it out. Um, when do you uh, so so the, the time frame for us initially is um, we have already ordered um, the stickers um, uh, for the containers um, we already have the containers for the businesses uh, based on our estimate of what businesses um, that were required it 
um, two cubic yards of, of, of waste or higher. Um, so we have the containers uh, for that. Um, the, uh, the residential containers are already there, so they're ready to go. Um, so all we would be looking for is approval to move forward uh, from the council. Uh, once the council said, um, yes, we're going to move forward, we're ready to implement this, um, then we would make a schedule um, um, with the city manager uh, and Stephen and um, start um, um, getting the containers out um, uh, probably the first part of December um, uh, to make sure we have everything in place. Uh, and then um, get the lab get the labels out and everything of that nature. The con we've actually ordered the the, the containers, um, but they haven't come in as of yet. <laughs> Supply chain. Yes. Yeah. So so um, um, uh, first part of December we should be ready to go. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Thank, Thank you. Very Thank much. you, Mr. Sanders. Got a question? Thank you. Oh, a couple comments. Um, as far as the subsidies that Republic and the city are gonna. Uh, potentially have to absorb. George and I are going to get pretty close. We have a meeting scheduled for Friday and what that's going to look like. Um, so more to come on that. Secondly, uh, fiscal impacts of the city have already started. They have already started before we even implement this stuff. Uh, we were lucky in the sense that we had somebody that could handle and try to get their hands around everything and Stephen Morales. But with that, it creates a hole behind him when he had other duties to do, which we have to backfill. Mm -hmm. So those are continuing ongoing grant or otherwise. Right. We're already increasing right. our, our, re our expenditures on this. Tyler, do we have any recourse? Is there any way for us to recover some of this? Um, is there anything coming down the pipeline that will help us? I mean, is there anything the state is sending down to support all these? I'm aware, I'm aware of this grant that we'll have to research more to see what exactly it funds, but uh, I, most things that I found, it doesn't address the long-term ongoing expenditures that we've had handed down to us. Mr. Castro, most likely the grant will cover education, and you can tell by the attendance at the public hearing how many people will uh, participate in that. Yeah, it is, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. I mean, I exaggerate the point. It's like they're giving you money to make flyers, man. Yeah. Like here, you know, it's like, here, make sure you do this. Okay. I mean, we, it's not just, it shouldn't be just money for flyers, but operational costs. I mean, and I totally agree with you, Tyler. Um, and there should be another uh, way for us to recover some of these costs. I mean, I think you look at the model of the regional board and how that's probably how it's going to work. So Cal Recycle will be the new regional board, yeah. and their, their funding will come from fines from us. Yeah. So, and, uh, we just... A million dollar fine, <laughs> you know, punitive on this community, poor mm -hmm. community. Right. Yeah. But you know, it's like no, you're, you know, you're the bad. Oh, we, and we just we just made another deal with regional board, yeah. city of Calipatria, where I've been working for 20 years, uh, has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on fines to regional board, and very little help. Yeah. Think about it. To dump water into the new river, you're fine. As, as right. Said, as, right. Right. As a last we comment, the pollution and we get fined. as a last comment, I think this will probably go over about like the plastic bag elimination program in California has gone over, where everybody's using a three times as big bag and, and they're throwing them all away because you can't use them because of COVID. So everybody just chucks them in the trash, and that's just the way it goes. We saw what it did to downtown San Diego, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah we've seen that. Oh, yeah. And, you yeah. Know, they we've seen that. So this will be about the same. But that's all right. I and mean, we'll do it if we have to. That's what we have to do. Now they'll have buckets instead of bags, right? Right. 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 And if I could just speak um, towards uh, the city's view on how we may handle enforcement. Um, the way that our current department looks at water wasting as well as um, backflow uh, prevention. Um, I think our community does well um, in addressing the needs, um, even though some of these regulations may not be welcomed here. Um, our community is good at, at meeting these requirements. In, in terms of backflow, this year we're at 92% compliance. Uh, so uh, again, our community is making that effort um, to, to meet those requirements. And, and when it comes to water wasting and, and protecting a pre uh, our precious resource um, that is water 
water um, here locally. Again, uh, we see that sometimes people leave their water on a little bit too long and, you know, sending a, a, a friendly reminder just indicating, hey, you know, can you just uh, uh, reduce your water usage um, and or not waste that water? We usually get a compliance with that. So, again, um, you know, yeah, again, these regulations are coming down from on high and, um, you know, uh, it's my office duty to try and, and uh, educate the public and make sure that they're aware that we do need to uh, have assistance in, in a complying with these reg regulations. And I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I do want to make sure that people do understand this is not something that the city of Brawley is mandating, right? Because I think people confuse that when they see, you know, um, you know, the city requiring something, right? They don't know where that comes from. So it's just important for people to recognize it as well. Thank you. Yeah. And George, thank, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Public hearing. Now I'm going to open the public hearing and look for any questions or comments from the public. No questions online? Nothing. Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. Any further questions or comments from council before we make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what you, uh, just for clarification, what you are voting on is the adoption of the ordinance, which is, what, 15 pages plus? First reading. First, First reading, reading of, yes. Okay. Does anyone want to make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> I know George is under pressure. He just wants to. Yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll make a motion. So I can get these buckets out to people, please. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to those buckets. I really am. I just... I'll just ask. I, I, uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve, approve item 5B. That's what we're on, right? Yes. Is there a yeah. second? Oh, come on. Just, just because there probably won't be a second here, I'll, I'll second the motion. <laughs> right. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Like this. Reluctant. Reluctant. <laughs> Reluctant. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Well, that first first reading is of the ordinance has passed. Just not to be out of line, but since most of that ordinance was mandated by the state, I don't know why they didn't just adopt it and say, yeah. right. that's, that's what I, yeah. Right. Right. Why, 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 why did they put it back on us? Yeah. And then, then we're the ones to blame for everything. Right. I had to write it, right. but it was a model ordinance, right. and there's yeah. about three three things you could leave yes. out. I left right. out every single thing I could. I've learned to expect it. Right. It's not even burial. It's just like, <laughs> why are we responsible for somebody else's? You know? What we're going to pay to advertise? I'll summarize. Okay. All right. We really have to push the underserved community part of things whenever we yep. go for grants because we are really underserved. Two thirds of our city. Uh, two fourths. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Just take, take a breath, breath after that one. <clears throat> Okay, okay, we'll move on, on to item, item 6, six regular business. Six a, a is an update on City of Raleigh Declaration of Local Emergency as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Overall, Overall outlook presented by our fire, fire chief, chief mm -hmm. Mike York. York. Mighty, Mighty fine, fine driver, driver, by the way. way. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor members, members of the Council and City staff. staff. Mike, Mike York, fire chief, City of Raleigh, bringing, bringing the... Uh, uh, most, most recent COVID-19 update, update for our local area. area. Uh, uh, keeping it brief, brief, what we're seeing is a slight decrease in our numbers, numbers um, but we're, we're still recording um, positive cases. cases. We're, we're recording people, people getting, getting hospitalized. The two, two notable, notable events we, I would like, like to bring, bring up was, was we're, we're seeing a the number, number of our hospitalized patients has slightly decreased. Decrease. However, However, the number of our Patients in the ICU, ICU is almost, almost double, double since, since my last report. report. So, so it's something to note that, that we do need to educate our community that, that we are still in a pandemic. People still, still need to take, take precautions, maintain awareness, awareness and uh, most, 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 most importantly, uh, uh, take, take the steps, steps necessary when they are experiencing symptoms, symptoms to not expose others. others. Uh, what uh, we've also seen is an increase in the percentage of ventilator use, which is yeah. uh, one, one of the major, major concerns, concerns that we had about this time, time last year during, during our peak surge. surge. Um, so, so we have 59 ventilators available in our, in our county, county and 25 are in use, use so just, just, just under 50%. 50%. Um, 
variant, variant data. data. So, so the, the Delta, Delta variant, variant, which, which has been talked, talked about a lot in news, is our, is our most common, is our most detected variant. We have 635 cases of the Delta, Delta variant, variant here in Crow County. County. Um, um, the 1849 age group, obviously, is the most, is one of the most affected, affected, because, affected because, because it's one, one of the broadest age groups that they, that they list. list. However, However, we found, found um, there's 335 cases in the 18 to 49 age group. group. However, in the 0 to 17 age group, we have 172 cases. So we're seeing school-age children experiencing um, symptoms and, and, and uh, the effects of the variants. Um, vaccine, vaccine status, status of variant cases, so not vaccinated, 62%. 22% of those children under 12, uh, which are now eligible for vaccinations should, should choose. Um, vaccinated, vaccinated persons, persons so, so breakthrough, breakthrough cases, cases, people, people are, are vaccinated, vaccinated and still contract the, 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 the disease is 18%. Uh -huh. so, so we're experiencing about, about one in five, five breakthrough cases, cases right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike, uh, do you know, do you know what, what, that, what, that, what that difference, difference is between, between now and, and the, the last report that you gave? gave? I, don't I don't have the, the, that data available in front of me. I certainly can bring, bring that, that as, as a comparison for next week. Oh, no, 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 no. So we can track the trends. It is important to note that nationwide and locally it's been reported that those who are vaccinated and test positive experience reduced symptoms and significantly reduced hospital stays and very, very significant, significant uh, significantly reduced, reduced counts of ventilator usage. Chief, Chief uh, question, question, and, and I've, I've been trying, trying to find, find this myself with our, our meetings with the county, county. Maybe, maybe you have a better, better source. Any, any data, data on reinfections, natural, natural immunities, immunities, anything, anything about, about of these, these unvaccinated, unvaccinated that are in the, in the hospital, hospital, how many have had COVID before? before. I'm, I'm, I just, just like, like to see the data. So that, that data, data has not been, been very widely distributed. distributed. I, don't I don't have any recent numbers. numbers. I do know that we are now almost two, two years in this pandemic, pandemic. And, and I do know about this time last year, uh, reinfection, reinfected cases were extremely low in terms of, I want to say, I'll get better, better numbers. numbers. I think, I think a year, year in, we were less than a thousand worldwide. So, wow. yeah, so there is um, some indication, I'm not an immunologist, but there's some indication that natural immunity is. No, I, w I was just curious if you were able to find that information because I've been trying left and right just to have the data, whatever it says. And the best answer whatever is it's not very readily available. Right, yeah. 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 It's amazing. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 And then the last, uh, the last case I want to, or last instance I want to bring up is that the, the Imperial County uh, Department of Public Health is also tracking other variants. There's six other variants. They're all given Greek letters. Please do not ask me to recite those. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we're, uh, the Imperial County Department of Public Health website shows 363 cases of the, uh, amongst the other variants. And again, as a, as a reminder, as a pandemic or any sort of virus like this, as its life continues, what we start seeing is it mutates, it changes. Those are the variants that we're experiencing. And again, the actual original uh, variant that was detected in the United States is no longer being detected. So we're we'll moving past the original variant. Um, I do. I will provide uh, the information in regards to tracking what our what our uh, our numbers are from a week to week basis, and then we'll try to find numbers for reinfection rates for our next meeting. If there's any other questions, I will do my best to answer. That's good. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Item 6B, discussion and potential action to approve Jaded Thunder, the United States Special Operations Command training exercise for May 2nd to May 12th, 2022. This will be presented by our city manager, Tyler Salcido. Backup is on pages 99 to 113. Oh, oh <laughs> Sean, yeah, uh, come on up. Um, Sean, Sean um, McGriff is here, uh, Intel security planner for this uh, operations, and I'm just going to hand it over to him, and he has all the details, and I appreciate your patience through our those public hearings. My first question is, how much do you pay the guy to come up with the name for these operations? Uh, they, there are a series of, ex of exercises. So there was a jaded series of exercises. Okay. There's thunder and night and so forth and so on. So they have different components to it. Right. Mm. You Sounds see, we're a jaded cool. council. Hi, <laughs> 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 so I'm Sean McGriff, a uh, military exercise planner with Jaded Thunder. Uh, jaded Thunder being a special operations exercise. Uh, 
This is my job. Next sli or on the slide here, we have what is Jada Thunder? Jada Thunder is a joint fires interoperability exercise. And what that really means is from the a joint perspective, we have each service component being Air Force, Army, Marines, Navy, uh, as well as some of our foreign national partners will come in and work a skill set or we'll train through a skill set, uh, providing them that opportunity through this exercise. And we do that through different scenarios and locations uh, for the exercise. Two of the locations that we have chosen here in California are military sites, the third being here at Brawley, uh, being the urban environment that we'll operate in. What are the two other sites? Uh, it's going to be San Clemente and then China Lake. Okay. So from this perspective, the exercise itself, Jada Thunder, is specifically um, geared towards our joint terminal attack controllers. So in the graphic, you kind of see there you have two different component forces, blue force being our U.S. forces, red force being the enemy forces. Uh, we'll have air components, so our Air Force, uh, Marine, and Navy assets will be flying overhead. The blue force being the JTACs, they are in communication with those kinetic strike assets overhead, uh, striking things on the ground. So they are the, the individuals who are being evaluated, certified to perform that job in forward operations or in combat operations. So to give you a perspective of the macro of the exercise, it says 2nd through the 12th of May. Uh, the actual training dates being week one and week two in the red boxes there is the 4th, 5th, and 6th, and then the 9th, 10th, and 11th. So those six days, each day, there'll be two iterations conducted, and they're three-hour iterations. Uh, so from time frames, each day you're looking at uh, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. and then 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. is when our forces would be in the area conducting notional strikes on targets. What kind of what kind of noise yeah. are you are should, you talking about for that, house. that laid out? <laughs> yeah, you just pinned right on my right. slide. Okay. All right, so for the exercise, when we look at different elevations, we are actually operating above 10,000. That's FAA's minimal requirement for aircraft within the the um, area here, and, but we are actually operating at 12,000 and above. Well, what does that sound like? So 12,000 feet with an A-10 flying, or I'm sorry, an A-10 flying at 10,000 feet, uh, studies have actually shown that it, it produces approximately 64 decibels on the ground. What is that equivalent to? A home unit or a home air conditioning unit 100 feet away produces approximately 60 decibels. So you're going to hear a low rumble, but uh, it's no more than what you're going to hear on the ground. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and our air conditioners, air conditioners will be running then anyway. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's just it's a, it'll it's feel extra cool. It's a, so, it's a sound of freedom, right? <laughs> if you want extra cool, then we're going to have to come down a little. Louder. <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping it's a less. Right. So within the area itself, uh, or here in Broadly, you're going to have a red team, or I will have a red team working here. I specifically do a lot of the coordination and set up for this red team. Uh, it's going to be approximately 15 to 30 personnel that will be operating, residing here in Brawley. Uh, they'll operate 8 to 16 vehicles that is in support of the exercise. And things that they're going to be doing uh, per the scenario that is developed, they'll be going to certain areas or approved areas, uh, whether it be city-owned or private-owned uh, locations. <coughs> they'll be loitering in that area. They'll park cars. They may move some stuff from between vehicles. They'll drive around the city. Uh, occasionally, they may lay down and play dead. They may run. It all depends on what, out of that scenario, on the action taken upon them, what we tell them to do. It's like a, a, every day in Brawley. That's you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Been here twice. I haven't seen that yet, but uh, we could work something out. Uh, as far as the blue team, the blue team will be in town intermittently. So during that three-hour iteration, uh, working with the uh, Brawley Airport, they will infill uh, via helicopter or fixed wing to that location. It'll be 10 to 25 personnel, and there will be four to six vehicles staged out there for, out there for them to use uh, during that, that three-hour block of time. Uh, as far as what they're going to look like on the ground between the red and blue team players, they will all be wearing civilian attire. They should blend in with the local populace. There won't be any military gear. Uh, blue team will have some comm vests on. You may see some large SUV-type vehicles with extra antennas. Probably no more, no less than what you know the police force has or local <coughs> law enforcement has, um, but it shouldn't be any different than what you normally see on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, we try not to bring in the military and start spooking everybody. <laughs> Uh, that might actually be a good thing around here, you know, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Come, martial law. Yeah. <laughs> Stop we stealing have, trash cans. We have worked with the police departments, like, asking them, what areas would you like us to <laughs> <laughs> No kidding. So, but the, the intent is, you know, not to Certainly. cause chaos we or understand. cause any safety concerns. And that's one of the primary goals is we're doing this coordination and approvals through the city council is to ensure that we're also working with law enforcement for that safety initiative. Uh, last thing to note on the slide, there will be no weapons. The only weapon you're going to see is a flashlight. Hmm. As far as locations, you'll notice that on the slide that some of the locations have been marked out. Uh, during our previous visit, we talked to some of the locations did not work out for our requirements and or private property owners uh, did not authorize use of their areas. I'll give you a moment for that. But you can see it's mostly scattered to that southwest location from Central Brawling. Some of those were subdivisions that had been, mm -hmm. that had stopped being built Stop. and now they're back in under yeah, construction. Yeah, built now. Yeah, with previous imagery we had showed them as, as subdivisions with no buildings. Um, no, in fact, the only subdivision area that had buildings was the east subdivision up by the airport. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So which was, brings me to tonight, uh, what you would expect from us, public information. We already have our, our public affairs officer has approved this statement on the slide. Uh, that would have, is what we would provide you all for release to the public, uh, making them aware that we're going to be in the area during that time frame. You see something a little suspicious, uh, obviously you all are going to know about it. Uh, the operation information security, those are some of the practices that we put in play, not only for our certification evaluations, ensuring that we are protecting information, uh, but also so that we're not throwing information to the public that they shouldn't have. Uh, obviously, property use approval, we really can't go into somebody's private property without any, any issues because then law enforcement does get involved and people get hurt. And then the law enforcement and coordination, I'll get up to on the next slide uh, as far as what that entails. But overall, it's the purpose of guarding the military training approval for the city-owned managed properties, uh, establishing that communication line and maintaining it throughout the, the exercise, deconfliction of any concerns or issues that anyone may have, as well as establish that awareness. Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. On that one, on the other previous slide. When you tell members of the public that you're going to conduct a fire support exercise throughout the city, sometimes fire support gets them a little bit, a uh, little bit uh, kind of concerned. Yeah, I'm thinking if you said it, it was like a military exercise, or no a life fire support exercise, or something like that, I think you would be better than fire support because when you talk fire support, many of the public think you're going to be shooting or you're going to be doing something that's related to fire, and I think they yeah, perhaps a description of what fire support is, like in parentheses or something. I thought the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and it makes perfect sense. I mean, changing it to military sport exercise. That, I think that that'll. I think that'll well. pass. <laughs> yeah. Pass public scrutiny much better. Yeah. Thank you. Now, coordination with local law enforcement. Uh, we do like to keep a close, tight knit communication with them. Uh, any areas that we're going to be operating in for each individual day, we'll provide them with that location. What boundaries that we're constrained to. Uh, how many people are going to be operating in for our red team, what they look like, as well as what vehicles are going to be operating, and uh, for our blue force team, what vehicles we're going to have maintained in the area. So that way they know if somebody gets a strange call at dispatch, uh, <laughs> they will. they're already going to have that information to identify that, oh, okay, it's the exercise guys that are, are doing some really weird things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They will probably. <laughs> People probably won't notice. Mm -hmm. Oh, you'd be surprised in <laughs> Brawley. People are nosy. I've gotten some pretty strange calls over yeah. the past six years. Uh, there will be a United States Special Operations Command realistic military training member here. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Bill Norman, he, uh, he lives just north of San Diego. Hmm. Uh, he was unable to attend tonight. But he will reside here in Brawley during the exercise to maintain any direct face-to-face -face coordination and or uh, deconfliction with any, anyone that approaches the team and starts asking questions. They'll be redirected to the RMT guy or okay. Mr. Norman. But he will reside here, and again, he'll be checking in 
almost daily with, with the local law enforcement just to ensure that they know where we're working at and, uh, and if there's any calls, he'll work some of those issues out as well. So what is it the benefit to Raleigh? Um, but mostly it just boils down to money. Uh, it's not going to be the millions of dollars in grants. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but over that 12-day period with the personnel and the prices that I took out about a month ago or, or uh, wrote down a month ago, calculating hotels, uh, how much fast food, sorry, they're going to be eating while they're Fast food, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Like they says, so what, just sorry. put their leftovers in but a bucket. Sure that, yeah, yeah, just like in a bucket. Put them in a bucket. Yeah, yeah, make sure they, yeah. we need them to watch their weight. Yeah. 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 Lick your plate. Uh, as well as the vehicles and gas that they're going to be as and other expenditures. Uh, it totals about thirty-seven thousand dollars over that that twelve-day period. Hmm. Gas prices have gone up, so, yeah, so it'll, it'll be like one point two million. You're looking at May time frame, so some the summer. Keys. Well, spring, uh, hotel rates, I don't know if yeah. they change here in Raleigh or not. Mm. They mm. might change a little. They probably go up. They just, might have just figured they go, they're going to yeah, go up. I oh, doubt you if they'll go down. Okay. They'll go down in May, like, probably. Right? 64 decibels of AC. Yeah, well, it's right? better than sleeping in tents. Yeah, you know, yes. That's, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Uh, just to, to hit home, the, the key points here, establishing that line of communication, and we will maintain it throughout, uh, regardless of what you all decide tonight. Uh, the public information as far as getting it out so that they are aware that we're in the area and not to not to think that we're coming in and trying to take over the town or, or uh, military law. Uh, verifying the owner managers of certain properties. So far we've gotten a hold of everybody. There's a couple that uh, work with you all to find the, the individual who owns it. Uh, and then potential areas in the military uh, training purposes, that particular bullet refers to if you – local law enforcement or fire department has an area that they have designated as a training area. We typically like to use those as well. Uh, but our blue team or military personnel sometimes like to have a forward uh, operating area. So if there is a, a room within a building or a city-owned building that we can use, it doesn't have to have power. We bring all of our own battery-operated power. Uh, they will have utilize that uh, in most of the scenarios. So I will work with you all to, to identify that location as well. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with the red team. I'll work with the local hotels, uh, defining where or getting them the best rates and locations where they could stay, uh, as well as identifying an area for them to set up all of their gear. And then uh, scheduling the events. So if there is something that is occurring, obviously 2nd through the 12th of May of 2022, uh, you've got a Cinco de Mayo, so that event, how large that is, where that's going to be located at, uh, working through that deconfliction to ensure that we're staying away from any public events that are yeah. going on. Uh, okay. Dispatch, working directly with dispatch, RMT will uh, maintain the coordination of where we're working at, as well as the vehicles and so forth, uh, and personnel. And then, again, it all boils down to the resolution of issues and conflicts to ensure a safe training event. So that's what we're asking for tonight is for city-managed um, property as well as the exercise operating within the town of, Bra of Brawley um, is your all's approval to do so. All right. Any questions? A couple of questions. Just, just a couple of questions. Uh, why, why are you choosing Brawley? I think you said you'd done it twice here before. I, so, no, I've been here. This is my second time visiting okay. Brawley. Yeah. Uh, the major reason of why Brawley was chosen is because of the airspace. Uh, the airspace is large enough for some of our fast-moving aircraft to be able to make a turn without busting any a FAA requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I sat in a meeting where somebody said, because Brawley looks like just like an Iraqi city, <laughs> like a Middle Eastern yeah. city. Uh, that was for a different uh, exercise, though. Different so, exercise, but yeah. I... I I, I, uh, I'm not lying. No, they, did the, they said that Cat, uh, Pat Williams Park, that area resembled it. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the layout of the, mm -hmm. the, they can see that. I've always, <laughs> I've always been in favor of the military operations here. So we support the Marines and and the other military SEALs, whoever, whoever, whoever are working here. Yeah, Marines, especially the Marines from Yuma, mainly, and and, and and the Navy Miami base Air and all that stuff. We all, I've always been supportive of all that. We do get a few complaints. Uh, most of those are noise related after, say, the nine o'clock time frame so rest assured that we need to be very sure about what the range of uh, noise is going to be because that's where I've gotten most of my complaints from now I'm totally supportive and I would put up with the noise because you know, you're, talk, you're talking about 
uh, someone who, who has many relatives that have served in combat situations in the military. So I'm totally supportive of what you need to do and get these young men and women trained to do what they need to do. Um, but, but understand that, that that is a concern of ours because as it becomes a concern for our citizens. Other than that, I don't get too many complaints about any of the things that go on, and they seem to do very well with working with both the police department, the citizens of the, of the Brawley, and I think everybody's pretty proud that they're able to help do that type of training. So with that, I'm always going to give approval. I just, I just do have a concern about that window, the two hours there, the window. Is it your motion? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll motion make the motion. And, and yeah. you're probably going to have more noise complaints during the last part of that bowl as the guys are being picked up from Brawley Airport. Mm -hmm. That's a possible. Now that, now that will impact those individuals that live in the area around the Brawley Airport. I, so that would be, you know, that might. I've in over the course of time here, uh, and I've been on council for 14 years now. Um, and during the exercises, I've gotten exactly zero complaints. So, you know, I'll second your motion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed yeah. or abstentions? Great. Thank, Thank you for your thanks. presentation. Thank you. You all have a good evening. I will, yeah. caution you, I will caution you. Just have the guys watch out for fireworks because we yeah. yeah. we'll shoot them. The odd fireworks. You know, it's too bad that you're not bringing them in for a uniform. My Air Force only, or are they multi brand Oh, no, I'm no, sorry. No. I was just my kids love it. Last time, uh, some of the Marines were over at the park, volunteer park right by my house, and we actually went over and took pictures with them. The kids, they, they were, they were yeah, fascinated I by it. I've heard the story. They, they landed a helicopter just, in the park, gave some rides or a tour of the helicopter. No, it wasn't. That was years and years ago. Go, yeah, that's cool. That anymore. I want to ride in one. <laughs> Unfortunately, in these aircraft, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love you. Yeah. Yeah. There's specialized equipment on the right. helicopters yeah. that we use. Um, so your question about the JTAGs, they're not just Air Force-centric. It is all services. Uh, they all have personnel. They get trained. Okay. Yeah, I participated in several of those back in the day. It was calm. Yeah. So we did we have of, one UK team that shows up. The yeah. JTAC, uh, uh, WTI, CACs, and all that stuff out here. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank we you appreciate again. you Thank very you. much. Thank you. All right, moving on to something much less exciting, <laughs> item 6C. Tyler's going to tell us about what well, we're going to discuss and, and potentially action. act to authorize an expenditure in the amount of $29,205 for a consultant to derive an all-jurisdiction master tax sharing agreement. Backup is on pages 114 to 122. Uh, I won't take offense to it not being exciting. Um, uh, as the mayor has, has stated, uh, uh, I, as city manager, looking for direction on whether to move forward with a proposed expenditure of the 29000 and change for a consultant to derive an all-jurisdiction master tax agreement, sharing tax sharing agreement, excuse me. Uh, the Imperial County Local Agency Formation Commission, uh, or known as LAFCO, is a local area government agency that is independent of the county and the cities of Imperial County. Uh, part of LAFCO's duties include overseeing boundary changes like annexations, uh, extension of services uh, between the county and cities, and, and also special districts. Uh, the Imperial County LAFCO consists of five members two Imperial County supervisor, uh, supervisors that represent the County of Imperial, two city council members to represent the seven cities, all the cities in the county, but two council members from different cities, and one public member to represent the public at large in Imperial County. Uh, one requirement for annexations to occur, uh, moving the jurisdiction of parcels from the county to a city, is for a tax sharing agreement to be in place for the future property tax revenues produced by that property. Uh, the county of Imperial's position has long been to retain, has long been to retain a large share of the revenue, and, and I have trouble with this word, perpetuity. I got it. At, at some point, a master again. Can you say it again? No, oh, you got me. Oh, see. <laughs> Perpetuity. There, there you go. At, at some point, a master, a master tax sharing agreement existed between the counties and its cities, but uh, since that agreement expired several years ago. Uh, tax sharing agreements must be negotiated for each annexation one, uh, as, as they arise. Mm -hmm. This has reportedly caused delays in development, backlogged annexations, and other issues. Uh, several months ago, LAFCO, on advice from the executive officer of LAFCO, opted to cease annexations until another master tax sharing agreement is in place. Uh, the city managers met with the county and LAFCO through our uh, CCMA, which is County and City Managers Association, to attempt to solve the issue. It was decided at that time in July 
uh, that a consultant should be engaged to examine master tax sharing agreements in other counties, recommend a draft and uh, a local master sharing tax sharing agreement to be adopted by the county in the seven cities. Uh, the estimated cost is approximately two hundred and four thousand dollars to two hundred and ten, roughly, uh, with Brawley's contribution totaling twenty nine thousand two hundred five. If approved, the uh, funded it would be funded by prior fiscal year savings and professional services, which Carla will address in her uh, budget roundup here on the next session, the fis last fiscal year. So, with that, I'm open to any questions. Um, uh, one of the supervisors called me. Uh, we had the discussion, right? This were uh, about a month ago, they mentioned that the county had money to loan to us uh, if needed. Is that still an option? I wouldn't think so. Uh, we're going to. Um, we have. We it just if if council souls approve, we we have some savings from last year that we'll, we could use for that. Okay. What's the downside to not uh, going along with the with the sharing agreement? Well, that would depend on uh, who you ask. Um, <laughs> I've had, uh, just on the side, I've had conversations with uh, developers and, and certain city managers, and, and even from the developer's perspective and their attorney saying that uh, LAFCO, for them to stop all development just to, to rely on a master tax sharing agreement, which is going to take a long time, and we may never even get there, to stop that and not move forward on individual annexations, they don't think they have a strong case. Yeah, yeah, they might be sued or whatever. Yeah, they, well, they could be. Yeah, it's they, it's they not going to be an easy task to once, even if this is approved. It is approved, just for the record, by everybody but Brawley and Westmoreland right now. Okay. Um, and it doesn't mean that we were going to get to a tax sharing agreement because it's kind of a cookie cutter approach. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of arguments uh, back and forth. Is. Absolutely. So absolutely, there is. But at least it's developed if we can. If we get yeah. there, sure. Right. At least mm -hmm. it's developed. So and, and it may streamline our development yeah. processes because this is this is taking way too long yeah. to do these annexations, and we get into big discussions and arguments with the For county years. and between yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. I think this this at least yeah. puts something in place, yeah. and maybe it needs to be revised, and maybe it'll need to, need to be adjusted as we move along. Yeah. But at All least right. it's an agreement. I'll make a motion to approve the item. I'll second. So moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Madam carries. Item 6D, discussion and potential action to receive and file the 2020-21 general fund year-end budget report and approve the amended budget carryovers from fiscal year 2020-21 to fiscal year 2021-22, presented by Carla Romero, our finance director. Backup is on pages 123 to 129. Thank you, council okay. members. Um, good evening. I hope you're all doing well. It is 8 p.m. Uh, so with that in mind, I am trying, I will try to culminate hundreds of thousands of transactions that we had um, throughout the fiscal year into this four-page report and then into a brief presentation tonight. Um, so I'm going to hit on a lot of highlights, um, high-level discussion, but if you want to dive deep, you know I love to talk numbers and budget, and we can go there. Mm -hmm. um, so let's so get moved. started here. So let's talk a little bit about just the fiscal year-end process in general. So the fiscal year-end does end June 30th. We are now on November 16th. So what has been happening, right? Why is this report now coming to us? Um, so it ends June 30th. New fiscal year starts July 1st. Uh, we have a 60-day, what's called an accrual period, meaning all of July and August, we still pay invoices for the prior year that ended June 30th. And then we're also recognizing revenue during that time and um, into the prior year so that we, we have those, those accruals happening. We are also working in the new fiscal year at the same time. So we've got two fiscal years in our heads. And then we write quickly after that, flip into September and October and start working on all of our analytics, our data, reconciliations, audit requirements, hundreds of thousands of reconciliations to make sure that all the entries were properly recorded in the prior year. And then um, now we're almost done with that. We are finalizing our audit. We're preparing our financial statements. And so today's report is going to focus only on the general fund. And the reason for that is because our financial statements are a culmination. It's a 200-page report, and it has all of the different funds of the city, but it doesn't allow us time to really talk about the general fund, which is the most important fund in my mind of the city. Mm. 
Okay. So uh, this report is focused just on the general fund. It does include a summary of any major fluctuations from the final budget for both revenues and expenditures. And as Tyler mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about our revised carryovers. We had some estimates that were originally provided when the budget was adopted in June. Um, but as I just mentioned, we still had invoices that were being paid through July and August. So we take a look back and see where <laughs> those really end and what are our current needs. And then what can we fund with some of those um, um, uh, cost savings that we had, or what are some projects that are still ongoing. And then not last but not least, we're going to also review our reserve balances and where those are ending for the year. So let's talk briefly about revenues. And again, these are high level. These are all of the categories. Um, overall, we're seeing a very um, stronger than anticipated revenues uh, for the general fund. We did have an evolving pandemic. Uh, that was occurring. We had waves of infections and restrictions that were thrown at us. Remember, this is uh, the period from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Uh, so taking a look back and just re remembering what was happening during that time is really important. Um, really unpredictable patterns is kind of the tone of where, what we were under at that point in time. But surprisingly, even under those circumstances, um, tax revenues were higher than anticipated for sales taxes, um, our transit occupancy tax, and even our utility user tax was slightly over um, budget. We also had um, the RPTTF stands for Redevelopment Property Tax Trust Fund. You know, I, we love our acronyms. Um, and that was a Chula Vista case um, regarding redevelopment property tax revenue that was uh, redistributed. Um, and in this particular county, the cities ended up getting more revenue and the county got less. Um, they did not give us the three-year retrospective adjustment. Uh, this is just an adjustment going forward, but it did give us some additional revenue last year. And then all of those revenue assumptions are built into this year's budget. So um, this year's budget is looking like it's on target based on those um, where last year ended. Um, we overall saw strong development continue. That was one of those essential services that was not um, prohibited during the pandemic, so that was strong. Um, and then under grants, we did have the CARES Act money that the city received, um, $331,000. And then we also had a delay, though, in our school resource officer that we weren't able to fund. And you'll hear a little bit about more about that tonight. And then also a housing grant that is still pending for the housing element, or else that uh, variance probably would have been larger uh, than the $174,000. Uh, minor... Um, you know, uh, variants there um, under for our fees and charges and also fines and assessments. Remember, there's a lot of shutdowns, not a lot of travel. And so um, it would be natural that you wouldn't have so many fines or people requesting services from the city at that point. Um, everything else looks pretty good. The I need to highlight that the transfers in, we did not um, use any of the highway relinquishment fund money that was anticipated to support the general fund. Our revenues were strong enough and uh, we did not need that. And that is the third year, Tyler? Yep, third year in a row. Yes. Congratulations. What's that ambulance service? Just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Under interest. Miscellaneous and reimbursement. Uh, those are our, our ambulance service reimbursements that we received, the AMR, the or the... Which is yeah. uh, right at about 15% now, I think, mm -hmm. which was uh, way back when mm -hmm. we were presenting that to you before Carla's time. Uh, yeah. I, I made the statement that we'd be lucky to see 15, but we're there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're lucky. Good. We're lucky. Yes. That, there you yes. go. That's yeah. our we're yeah. lucky. Got it. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. So let's talk a little bit about expenditures and those um, fun, those departments that were <clears throat> not within budget first. So on page 125 of the agenda, you have a list of 23 total departments. And so we're only going to highlight uh, some of the overages and then also some of the savings. Um, here the uh, on that page on 125, the savings are highlighted in yellow in that um, summary chart just to make it easier on the eyes. Uh, overall, our utility billing department, which resides under the finance department, was uh, over budget, and that's because a lot of our payment processing fees were higher, encouraging people to pay online, pay over the phone, um, but then in essence, the city also has additional charges based on that volume that increased during the pandemic, and we are still encouraging people to do so. Um, be, the other day, we had a really long line outside, and we kept telling people there's other forms of payment. Uh, please take advantage of those um, if, if you can. Uh, so 
so that um, you're not having to stand outside and wait in line. Uh, for planning, we also had a smart, slight overage, and that's because of the housing element update that was approved recently, and we do have a pending grant reimbursement for that as well. Uh, graffiti abatement, we just didn't have a budget in that, but um, we did um, amend that this year, and there is a budget for those services now. Uh, slight overage of 27540 for the fire station. Uh, lots of repairs and maintenance, and those are costly. Tires are expensive for fire trucks, and so are the doors um, at the fire station. Um, minor overage on animal control, $234, mainly because of overtime. And then the parks, um, because we had such strong revenue, uh, we have had an ongoing deficit in our capital improvement fund for parks because of the um, Alice Drew in park improvements. So that's been going on for a couple of years. And uh, so we went ahead and we funded that and that caused that overage for the parks department. This has been an ongoing audit item concern. And so we wanted to go ahead and eliminate that uh, with some of the savings um, that, that we had this year. So the auditors will be happy about that. Yeah, it was overtures on the cost of construction. Yeah. And that's clear. And, it's, it's, and it's been sitting the there yes. for years yeah. since it was built. Yeah. And we haven't had the opportunity to balance the books on that there, so, because it would require a transfer from the general fund. Hmm. Yeah. So if that's been made and included in all these numbers. So let's talk a little bit about budgetary savings and those carryovers that we've been um, re referencing tonight. Police and fire make up the majority of our budget, and they also made up the majority of our um, savings. Both departments had significant savings in their overtime and then also in professional services for police. Um, and we are recognizing some of those as carryovers for the police um, uh, into this fiscal year, if approved. Engineering had savings in professional services, also um, requesting a carryover in those so that they can continue those efforts and help augment the staff that they have. Uh, the Recreation and Line Center and the library had savings, but that was unfortunately because we had city closures, right? That is not savings that we would normally anticipate or, or want to have, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, we had minimal programming, alternative programming that was provided, um, temporary salaries or uniforms that were not um, didn't come to fruition because we just didn't have those services, um, rec leagues and stuff like that that didn't occur. Uh, or staff vacancies and turnovers. Uh, the other thing to note too, going into this year, although there were savings in overtime uh, for our public safety, we are kind of seeing the reverse now because we have a very high call volume and increase and so we're want monitoring that really closely. So every year there's a fluctuation and that's why we provide you these updates. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about this year um, coming up, but um, but it, can, it goes either way, right? It could be higher, it could be lower. Um, so we'll just keep monitoring that. But we do want to thank the departments for their prudent use and having all of these savings because overall we had 17 departments. Although these are the only ones highlighted here, we had 17 departments within the general fund that had savings last year. Wow. That was really good. Pretty good. That's great. Yeah. So our carryovers, they are detailed in Exhibit A. They were, um, I did give you the original estimates that were provided in the budget when it was adopted. Uh, overall, we are requesting that the general fund have a total carryover amount of $558,687 uh, for various items that are noted there. They are coming from budgetary savings. Uh, we are confirming those with you hopefully tonight so that we can include those into our financial statements that are currently being prepared. Um, and then the big majority of those are for multi-year capital project carryovers, uh, the total a little bit over $2.5 million, and those are in restricted funding sources. So I put those separately at the bottom uh, to clearly identify which funds those would be coming from. And last but not least, I want to go over reserves and why does the city have reserves? Um, Tonight was a great example, it just so happens to be that way, of number one there. I mean, I heard lots of unfunded state mandates. Uh, we also have federal mandates that we have to abide by, and I heard very little of ongoing funding sources for such things. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we also have economic fluctuations and the city doesn't want to have major changes in the way that we provide services, if at all possible, just because there is um, some sort of economic fluctuation. Reserves allow us to take a moment and really evaluate what is needed before making drastic cuts to any of our services. Um, they also support cash flow fluctuations uh, during the summer. That's when we receive the least amount of cash for a city. But it's also when we have big annual premiums for as our fiscal year starts for insurance, for pensions. We have bond payments that need to be made. And then we also um, have ongoing grants and CIP. And um, if there was a major disaster, FEMA could take years to reimburse us. So we would have to come up with that cash flow in order to cover those expenditures up front. I did a FEMA reimbursement one time. It took six years to close it out. So, And it was for a bridge that was washed out in India. So it, took, it takes a long time. And then you also want to consider future infrastructure and capital improvement needs. The city has about $63 uh, million worth of general assets. These are not enterprise fund assets, not water, wastewater, airport, none of that. These are just general assets of the city with an annual depreciation of about $2.3 million. And we don't currently have any funding set aside for replacement um, or improvements to these infrastructures. And that, that's a little bit scary, and we want to go ahead and present an option for you uh, tonight to address that. So let's talk about the numbers themselves. This is where our reserves ended last year, June 30th, 2020, and where the balance ended at uh, June 30th, 2021, and then far to the right, your year-over-year -year change. So we do have a small balance that is restricted for the library that the library board has. Um, and then two new categories there in the middle would be the committed carryovers that we've already discussed. Uh, and those are just for the general fund. Again, those um, the other ones for the CIP are, would be within their respective um, restricted funds. And then we are proposing to carry over or to commit, sorry, uh, Five, half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars into a capital replacement. That would be also a new reserve category, and that would allow us to have better planning for the future, uh, potential matching grant funding or large equipment purchases um, should they fail. IT is another good example of if we had a major IT infrastructure need, um, we would need to to have that money up front pretty quickly and. Um, that's very expensive to replace servers and equipment. And if you have like a data breach, they come in, they take all your equipment, you have to buy new equipment uh, while they investigate your, your data breach. And so those are good examples of what this could be used for. And then uh, still, even during all of that, because we had such a strong year, stronger than anticipated, our unassigned reserve balance would increase to about two, almost $2.7 million, which is just shy of our target based on current amended expenditures of about $5,000. So um, that good. is very good. Yes. So I'll leave it on this screen for a little bit and happy to take any questions or um, concerns, just anything. Carla, the, um, when, you, when you separate these out in different categories, do you, treat, do you treat those categories differently than you would just a general, re, general reserve? The general unassigned. So the only, each one of no, them. No, I'm talking about all, all of the different mm -hmm. categories, the carryovers, the capital replacements. Those are those are separate from the unassigned, correct? Yes, they would be clearly identified just as you see them on the screen within our financial and, statements. And mm -hmm. in theory, not able to be used for anything but what they're right. categorized as. Yes. Without council action. Without right. yeah. council okay. action. And, mm -hmm. and so, so... And even on that committed or the unassigned, if you wanted to use them, we'd have to come back to you to appropriate that funding, just like we do now. So the carryovers have a specific listing in mm -hmm. your exhibit mm -hmm. of what uh, have been identified for use. And so what that would do is it would amend this year's budget and increase and them the, yeah, and assign it, right? You're assigning it. You're committing it for that purpose. Um, but as it, is, as it stands now, the unassigned almost reaches our 15% uh, reserve policy. Right, under the, the new balance, yes. Wow, that's mm -hmm. a, very impressive. Yes, and I checked the numbers about 15 times, sure. and, and Tyler sure. and I had many, <coughs> many uh, discussions about making sure that we had categorized everything properly and captured everything for this last year.
totally. I absolutely do. Yeah. Good questions. Mm-hmm. Are we making no. a motion on this item? I, I think we probably should. Well, okay. Go You're going to go ahead. You know, no, go ahead. No. Pretty much sums yes. up what I feel. You know, so. I I just wanted to take a moment and really thank um, the city staff. You know, they were very prudent in the way that they used the city funds, and they continue to ask questions, find creative ways of finding solutions, uh, collaborating with one another uh, instead of just going out and, and duplicating efforts. So I I just want to commend them and recognize their, those efforts because that's a reflection of what we're seeing tonight. Um, and their ability to adapt under such circumstances with the pandemic is just incredible. Um, and you as city council members, I mean, your steady guidance, your commitment to the community. Tonight, I just want to say that you have been environmental experts, organic waste experts, COVID <laughs> panic monitoring experts. I mean, special forces training. We throw so much at you, right? Every single night. And on top of that, here I am talking to you about budget and finances. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be able to handle all of that is just super impressive. Um, so thank you for to flatter us for having <laughs> <laughs> for, for taking the time and being prepared. It really is impressive when you start to sit back and think about it. it it's a lot, right? I, I come from you from a budget um, expert perspective, but I don't have to know organic waste and read all of that stuff if, if I you know don't have to. Um, and then just you know even the businesses and the residents um, within the city that were really patient with us. We had to close facilities as discussed earlier. We didn't like it. We didn't want to. Uh, all those um, mandates from the state weren't easy to monitor and, and to try to enforce. Uh, so thank you for uh, being patient with the city and um, and having a focus towards recovery and a safe reopening um, as we go forward. I will stop there. <laughs> Likewise, we're, we're very impressed with the finance department, with our city management. It's just, I, I've been saying, I've been saying for months to people that ask that, that I feel like we're going to come out of COVID financially and in other ways better off than we were going into it somehow miraculously. But this is, this blows my mind. This is really good information. It is. Thank you. Well, I, and I think Mr. Mayor, just to add on, just really um, do in large part of what you just said, Carla, about the entire staff. Yes. I mean, it, it really, uh, you know, I'm not just saying it because it sounds good. It, it is absolutely takes everybody uh, to make that happen. But I think the, um, sort of the public support behind that was completely or c- clearly evidenced with the passage of Measure U as well. So make no mistake about it, not, not just the, you know, the words we shared over the past few months. I think it's this work that set us up where you, it's the public confidence and there isn't anything more important than that. So thank you, Carla, your department, and really to everybody, Tyler, um, within the city and my fellow council members that, you know, really we got to thank our whole community mm-hmm. true. Uh, for coming out, that uh, um, you, you, you truly feel like you're a part of a community where everyone does care. You and, know, and there's so. and th- there's a lot of people that do, obviously. Yeah. I know there's some people, and, and they're misinformed, but if they just listen to the presentations, they weren't scare tactics. They, right. they were just yeah. very real. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just very real. So I'm glad that people listened and certainly appreciate all the work that you've done. Um, I know that uh, Tyler did a very good job in the finance director position. Yes. Um, and, you know, now he's a city manager doing a great job, and you're doing a fantastic job as our finance director. But so is staff. I mean, everybody, we have some good um, good people leading the charge, and I think it just goes to show. But this is impressive work, and we appreciate it. And it's everybody, including this council. I really say that. I know that sometimes we are not good at accepting, but we're leading this, right? And so, um, you know, staff doesn't always understand exactly what we do, but I can tell you I know I work with all of you, and I'm proud to work with you and our city staff and our leadership within um, the city. So everyone's doing their part, so I appreciate it. Very amazing. And then I think we've come a long way from, say, two years ago uh, when we were struggling and trying to use other yes. funds instead of our, you know, along with our reserves in order to kind of make things equal out. But I think this is really amazing. And, and coming out of COVID, it makes it even more kind of spectacular in that in that fashion because everybody, I think many cities around the state are hurt by the COVID. Many, many cities around the country are hurt by the COVID. Actually, We've done fairly well. I think we might have done better, maybe if we didn't have COVID. <laughs> However, I don't know that. But we're we're doing amazing. You're, you're doing an amazing job, and and the other and to the the city, the city departments, they're doing a great job. 
and, and it's just it's just something that we depend upon and, and we do depend upon everybody here to work together to achieve this kind of end and the end of year you know balances and all that kind of thing and so it's it's really truly amazing you know I, I just just to add to that I don't want to be left behind here but no I do appreciate all your hard work and I saw I mean everything that was presented here tonight from uh, Gordon and Andrea and the environmental component to um, Mr. Mireles's work on the compliance side and and your work I mean that is just it's an extreme like it's a lot of work and a lot of lot of uh, research and a lot of information being compiled to make this happen. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing, especially after this week. <laughs> it's a long, long week. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yes. You're welcome. Okay. Is there a motion to... I'll make a motion to approve. All right. A second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Thank you, Carla. And moving on to item 6E, discussion and potential action to receive and file a fiscal year 2021-22 first quarter budget report and approve the recommended budget adjustments, also presented by Carla Romero. Backup is on pages 130 to 134. Thank you. So again, really high level discussion. The first quarter usually doesn't have major um, adjustments to revenues or expenditures only because we're barely getting into the year. Um, we really reserve those, if any, time for mid-year. Uh, but we do have a couple of adjustments just based on actual activity during the first quarter. And so that'll be the focus of this presentation. So again, just a reminder, the budget is a living, breathing document. It's not just something that's adopted, put on the shelf, and then we just take it out at the end of the year. We are actually actively always monitoring our activity uh, within our budget, within all of the revenues and expenditures, and uh, we will continue to provide you quarterly updates um, on any variant variations from the budget. Stuff that does not have any changes from the budget was excluded from the report, or else the report would just be another big hundreds page budget document, right? So we want to focus our attention on what has changed um, in the first couple of months, and that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, we want to talk about trends, uh, current changes, and again, the first quarter focuses from July the 1st through September the 30th. And uh, so this is a lot of numbers on one slide, but it's all regarding just the general fund. We have uh, two revenue adjustments for grants that have been received, uh, totaling $22,762. And then right below that are the expenditure adjustments. The first two tie with the revenues. Uh, the only additional rev um, expenditure adjustment would be for fuel. As we all know, fuel prices are increasing. Uh, you heard me say earlier, we are on the road more, um, responding to calls more. Um, and so that is costing us a little bit more. And so there's various departments that need some um, revenue increase, um, uh, sorry, expenditure fuel increases in their budget. And the departments are detailed in the exhibit as well. So when you look to the right, um, the top uh, $17.3 million, that was our adopted, adopted revenues. We have had uh, approved adjustments uh, during different council meetings, and they are detailed on page 130. Uh, sorry, yeah, 131, um, and they total the $169,309. And then we just uh, talked about all of the carryovers for, we had some revenues uh, that are matching those carryover expenditures, and then also just the first quarter that ties to the left. And then kind of the same concept with your expenditures. And so what we're seeing, bottom line right now, current budget surplus is almost $91,000. Uh, but again, we're monitoring, we're actively monitoring, especially that overtime. Uh, so I don't want to get too excited about having a budget surplus because I may come with um, some expenditure increases at mid-year. But uh, as of right now, uh, we do have a surplus. And then when we looked at all of these other funds, these are all of the other special revenue funds. And so most of these um, just have to do with current activity. Uh, we do have two new funds that we have created. Our new financial system allows us to um, to create new funds, which also allows to have easier reporting uh, capabilities so that we can save time and uh, have a lot more oversight and just um, – it's just easier for us if we segregate those into their own special funds. The, um, we do have a senior citizen utility grant. We have um, already expensed about $37,000 of that, so that's the revenue and expenses. We still have money available. We have about $90,000 available. We want to help as many people as possible. 
please contact the finance department if uh, you have been impacted by COVID. We have both a grant for senior citizens and we also have one uh, just for um, those that are are just COVID impact um, uh, as well. And we have about $112,000 available in the other grant. Um, so, So please do reach out to us. And we have helped on the other grant about 45 individuals as well. Uh, the big one, uh, new funding we received in July was the American Rescue Plan Act funding. We did create a special fund separated from the general fund, so it's not commingled with any of our other revenues and expenditures. The cities, um, all cities in the nation received half of their funding um, in July. So for Brawley, that equates to about $3.1 million, with the other second half will be received next July. Um, we are not presenting any expenditure um, adjustments only because we want to really prepare a good plan and bring it to you. Although we we celebrate that we have um, funded reserves, we also have a lot of unfunded expenditures. And some of them or a lot of them can qualify for rescue, um, the ARP money. And so we want to put together a comprehensive plan for you, show you everything, and then also um, potentially categorize some of the higher priority items. Um, that can be funded. Is the so, three million the half? Yes, the three okay. million. So is there's the half. another three million coming. Yes, that is correct. Yes, um, and so you expect that update in December. We're currently working on it, and uh, hopefully, definitely by the second meeting in December. Hopefully, maybe the first. Hmm. So we'll be talking about ARP next. Uh, those three that are highlighted in orange there, those just grant reimbursements for several CIP projects for expenditures from the prior year received this year. And then we have reinstated our late fees. And again, the new financial system is able to break out those late fees. So need to recognize the revenue of those fees. We do not like charging fees. Please come in, uh, do payment plans, uh, take advantage of those grants. Um, but the late fees have been reinstated for water, wastewater, and trash services. And then the last and last but not least is our law enforcement. We do have some prior year of funding that has not been expensed. And so Commander McNish has been actively looking at uh, under the hood and checking uh, for any and all revenue that the city has for law enforcement. And so we're asking to go ahead and uh, appropriate that funding for some training. Um, it's restricted for that purpose. Okay. And uh, finance is always busy. So uh, in the next 60 days, here's a slew of things that we will be doing. We talked about um, kind of looking at, at grant opportunities. We do have grant interviews going on with our grant writer this month to identify all of those potential opportunities that are upcoming in the next cycle of grants. Uh, CalPERS did announce today, which was good, that they are going to remain have the discount rate remain at 6.8%, which is the current rate that it is at. So that was great news for cities overall. Uh, we're afraid that we're going to lower that, which would drastically increase our um, unfunded liability payments going forward. So that was a win for, for agencies. Uh, we already talked about the American Rescue Plan, um, evaluation of funding source, funding, potential funding. Uh, we're also working on our financial statements for last year, and we'll be presenting those to you probably the first meeting in January. And then also right after that, start working on the budget for next year and also developing a 10-year uh, long-term financial planning model that can be presented in conjunction with our budget process next year mm -hmm. and uh, then flipping into mid-year as well. So as you can see here in the next 60 days, if, if you hear me say what year, um, it's because we're working in three fiscal years uh, for about the next 60 days through March. <clears throat> so lots of numbers, uh, but... Always happy to, to do the finances. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions? No questions? Let's make a motion right. to approve the item. Been moved. Yeah, second. And seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Thank you. Good deal. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Item 6F, discussion of potential action to approve a memorandum of understanding by and between the city of Brawley and Brawley Union High School District to furnish a school resource officer and authorize the city manager and chief of police to execute the agreement. This will be presented by our new police commander, Jonathan Blackstone. Backup is on pages 135 to 143. Welcome, Commander. Good evening, Mayor Hamby, Council, City Staff, Jonathan Blackstone on behalf of Chief Duran. Here to discuss the memorandum of understanding between the city of Brawley and the Brawley Unified School District for the police department to furnish a school resource officer. 
In 2020, the city secured a $125,000 three-year cost-sharing grant that we will be working in partnership with the school district, which will be reimbursing the city on a quarterly basis, so it'll equate to no cost to us. Part of the grant requirements is a memorandum of understanding <clears throat> which outlines the roles and responsibilities of the SRO, the school, as well as the financials. A um, few of the things that the SRO will be doing, conducting workshops and presentations to students, being involved in student-oriented activities, and training school staff. We need to remember that this is not something new for the Brawley Police Department. We have provided a SRO for many years in the past, sometimes through grant funding, sometimes through the high school funding it for us. We have placed uh, Agent Moreno is a SRO at the school since September where he's been working with the kids and in conjunction with the uh, school staff. I've spoken with the superintendent. He's excited about him, said he's doing well. We, uh, Carl and I met with the superintendent to go over the M proposed MOU. They will be going over tomorrow night at the school board meeting, and he's confident that it'll be moved through. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? questions? Oh, sorry. Thank you for the presentation. It's been, my been a great program. Yep. It's yeah. a good partnership. Yep. It's a great program for the high school. Yep. And it's yep. a great <clears throat> program for us to be involved with the high school and have some exposure to the police department by the students, positive uh, exposure to the police department by the students at the high school. So they also like, have a uh, law enforcement program where they're doing classes for law enforcement. Right. Nice. He's going to be working with the uh, teacher of that course hand in hand to wow. any way he needs. Is that is that fairly new or is that something that's been around for a while? I believe it's the first year. Wow. Well, they've had other ones, but it's the first year with this. This is the first year with, with this, this teacher. Is it it's like a potential feeder program for IBCs? Yes, we yeah. are looking forward to working with them to get a... Uh, uh, almost like an explorer type relationship to teach them there, feed them to the ca uh, the college, hopefully bring them back to Brawley to work Very for nice. us. Very nice. That's, That's cool. Very good. That's okay. awesome. Good deal. All right. Uh, Make a motion to approve the item. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Item carries. Love thank that. you, Commander. Thank Love you. That. Commander Blackstone, thank you for your presentation. I know it's tough to get out in front of council sometimes, but you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on to item 7, departmental report. This will be a proposal regarding body cameras presented by our new commander, Renee McNish. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, commander McNish with the Brawley Police Department. Just wanted to provide a quick update for the body-worn camera. We did pr uh, prepare a draft RFP. And this is just to get competitive pricing and to also evaluate services from different vendors. We are also going to follow the best practices that were put into place by the BGA, which is the Bureau of Justice Administration. And I also wanted to touch on that. Um, I was part of uh, the program developers for the Imperial County Sheriff's Office and also District Attorney's Office. So we're not going to try and reinvent any new wheels. We're just going to use the, uh, the best practices that were, were learned. Also wanted to uh, state that the JPIA has already weighed in on their support for this program and also that we started discussion with uh, some of our staff to discuss any issues that they might have. Um, I do want to also say that um, it's, a, it's a big move in, in uh, providing transparency for our citizens and also assisting in the uh, judicial process. So super excited with this program. I know we're moving in the right direction and I'm also here to answer any questions that you might have. So you'll be bringing this back to us again in a future presentation with numbers and, and data? Yes. Yeah, so this was a budget item that was included for the uh, fiscal year 2021-2022. It includes uh, $50,000 for the purchase of body-worn cameras. Um, so we are hoping we're going to uh, get some competitive bidding that will come below that cost. So any cost savings, of course, we're going to be excited to talk about in the mm -hmm. future. Um, I do want to say that we've had some good success in talking to different vendors and they're going to be offering some different services that we're really hopeful on listening to not only satisfy the problems that we're having as far as uh, body-worn cameras on the field, 
but also the cameras that are utilized within the station when we're conducting different types of mm -hmm. interviews. Um, the one thing I really want to illustrate in this program, it's, it's the collection of evidence, and it's what really helps us secure criminal prosecution in court. It's not just about the body work cameras to prove that out in the field, that's not what actually happened. Here's a video of what happened. This is all about producing evidence that will be later on uh, taken into court right. to successfully <clears throat> prosecute uh, some of these offenders that we're dealing with. But it also gives the, uh, the officers that are out there that are doing the, uh, the difficult task of providing public safety services an opportunity to feel some level of uh, safety and comfort when they're contacting people. Um, I can tell you that uh, in the instance that uh, Councilman uh, Nava mentioned, a gentleman went in, onto his property, uh, stole uh, some stuff that belonged to him. We actually sent officers out there, and there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of people walking around, and having that body-worn camera that can kind of capture all that evidence that's going on, it, it definitely paints a different picture. Sure. Um, so it, it is extremely important in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I also want to go back to some of the things that were learned with the Imperial County Sheriff's Office and the District Attorney's Office, which... I want to bring to, to the program that we develop here was uh, in working with the uh, El Central Regional Medical Center, uh, some of the different stakeholders in, in El Centro, it really helped paint a picture to help us better understand the different cultures that impact our valley and our city. Uh, so it's definitely unique. You, there's, there is no uh, cookie cutter approach to this. We have to address those individual concerns from the, uh, the citizens and then also some of their health concerns that they may have when an officer enters um, Pioneer's Memorial Hospital um, to see if there's any HIPAA issues that uh, might surface if their camera is still recording. So um, when I developed this program for the Imperial County Sheriff's Office and for the District Attorney's Office, it was really utilizing some of the expertise coming from the attorneys, coming from some of the medical professionals, mm. and then also from uh, uh, county council. Uh, to really devise the best policy and program implementation to uh, get the most bang for our buck, so to mm -hmm. speak, for lack mm -hmm. of better terms. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to say that in the development of that program and what we intend on doing here for the city of Brawley is creating uh, a program that, that mirrors the program that was started over there because the program was so well-developed and so unique to the Imperial Valley uh, uh, complexities that come up, uh, it actually became a model program for Axon, which is the pioneer in body-worn camera technology. Uh, so I'm extremely proud of that. Uh, I did a lot of the, uh, the stakeholder meetings, a lot of the, uh, uh, the county council presentations, and uh, the, uh, the city uh, workshops to really develop um, a, a program that was unique to uh, the challenges that we face here in Imperial County. So I am extremely excited to uh, to get this program going, but I do understand there's some different things that have to be done as far as uh, uh, making sure we speak to the right people to, to get the best policy and the best program and training uh, for the city of Brawley. Uh, so if, if anyone has any, any questions, I'll do my best to answer those. You mentioned fifty thousand dollars. That's a, that's an initial outlay of cash for uh, the equipment itself. It, what are the ongoing costs? Do you know yet of of uh, data processing or, or or storage of video and that kind of stuff? So the biggest the biggest cost concern when dealing with the uh, body worn cameras is the the storage, the cloud storage. Mm -hmm. uh, by far, the equipment. Some companies uh, like Axon will give you the body worn camera and all the associated gear for free at no cost. It's just the cloud storage that really becomes oh. uh, the big ticket item. What I can tell you is the 50000 is going to be, um, um, it's going to cover the, the first year, uh, but it is a reoccurring cost, and that's something that the, the city does need to take into, uh, into perspective. This is not a, just a one-time, right. you pay this fee, and then it, you don't have to pay any additional fees. It is a reoccurring mm -hmm. cost. Um, but we are going to devise um, this RFP to hopefully get the best competitive pricing to to uh, reduce the the, yes. the cost. Um, but but you know, considering the cost, there's other things that we obviously as council consider, and that it's you know issues like litigation right. and things of that nature, <laughs> yeah. right? Increased so JPA right. 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 right? So no, I yeah. I understand. Yeah, and and council uh, council member Nava, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. So that was. 
uh, when we um, started the, well, when the Imperial County Sheriff started the program, uh, the an annual cost was, I believe, just over 130000 uh, a year. However, the amount of money that was invested into uh, covering some of the legal fees, attorney fees for citizen complaints and uh, claims of uh, property damage um, was significantly higher. After incorporating the use of body-worn cameras, those costs completely uh, dropped, if not um, vanished. Wow. And it's mainly because as people start learning... Uh, when, the, when they contact the sergeant or Being when they filmed. try to file a claim with the city, yeah. well, let me go ahead and review the body-worn camera. <laughs> Excuse me, what? And then all of a sudden the claim goes away. Yeah. So there's yeah. definitely going to be some, some cost-saving measures, but we won't know that until the program sure, it's is live and right. Right. been implemented. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's any, uh, any additional no, questions. I think you no, yeah, thank you're welcome. I appreciate yeah. the, okay. the research and, and the work that you've done yeah. ahead Expertise. of time. Expertise. That's, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank thank you Commander. You. And both commanders did a very good job yeah. during Catacol. Yeah, down for there. sure. I saw them looking sharp, so that's yeah. good. Good yeah. job. All right, item eight, city council member reports. We'll start with council member Wharton. I know this could be lengthy, and it's been a, a, a long evening. So just the, the, the nutshell was able to attend as many of the um, Catacol events as I could. But I will mention um, I was asked to speak and address um, the BUHS, victorious Bell Game winner team uh the i don't know it's been over whatever a week over a week ago um so that was really enjoyable uh just to take a few minutes and make a few comments there and uh you can still feel uh the the absolute pride and, and excitement around the community for bringing the bell back home so congrats to the team and you know probably can't hear that enough um, outside of that, especially when we get harassed by our, our neighbors down south mm -hmm. um, for the past three years. <laughs> right. um, outside that, Chili Cook-Off Parade, um, you know, Elks, numerous uh, local um, parties. Um, I will say for the record, I did not and was unable because I was out of town just that night. Um, and arguably the biggest event and that probably took place in the middle of town um, in, in the middle of the week. But uh, outside of that, um, I will definitely say in my observation, especially after a pandemic year, um, that was a tremendous um, a, a cattle call uh, a set of events across the board and, and certainly to our city. I know that's going to be echoed, but um, our staff that helped to make that happen. Um, I know, again, I know Chamber is relatively new to some of that, but I think, uh, you know, they took on the task um, partnering here with the city. And I, I think the citizens, not just in our, our town, but from all over came out um, in, in great numbers. And everything I heard was very, very positive across the board. Um, so, um, again, I, I think it's a sign of the time. So um, certainly was celebrating as much as I can, and in particular, uh, the way our community came, to get, um, came uh, together for the utility user tax. So those are my comments, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I'll defer to my rest of my council members. Thank you, Donnie. Councilman Castro. Yeah, uh, again, I want to echo those comments on the UT and thank our community for supporting and understanding the need uh, that we have here at the city, uh, including the changes that were made, along with eliminating the sunset, which is costing our community so much money. And it's a proposal that I made, so I know you guys took a beating over that, and that's my proposal. Um, uh, but again, looking at the finances, it saves us a lot of money, and so I'm extremely proud of our, the proposal that we put out and the fact that our community supported us and supported our, our city staff. Um, uh, mariachi night was great again i was asked to co-host uh saw everybody out there I, how many people do you think we had out there tyler Shoot, about ten thousand? Uh, yeah i would say that's so probably at least, least that more something than, more than 10, 10, yeah 10, it was it, i mean i couldn't see the end of the crowd when i was up on that stage so it was it was just awesome and the feedback from members of the community because <laughs> earlier i said the community is mocking me so <laughs> members of the community was very very positive uh, we had the mayor pro tem out there throwing chanclas, which is really cool. <laughs> I, I come in last. <laughs> you <way>. did. <laughs> I think you set me up, Ramon, no. <laughs> my friend Ramon. They, they, they handed him the, bo the boomerang chanclas? Yes, yeah. they kept coming back. Uh, it's a girl's chancla. It was a women's chancla. Yeah. That was a prom. You needed like, yeah, a floho or something. <laughs> Either way, uh, thank you to our mayor for coming out and addressing the crowd. Uh, I was very happy to translate for you. All your, your Spanish is pretty good. You could have done it yourself. Probably. But, probably. but uh, happy to be there for you. Um, 
And uh, and we uh, had the opportunity, since it was a Marine Corps birthday, to recognize our oldest and youngest Marine. Uh, our oldest Marine did not come out, so we just gave the shirts away. But our youngest Marine did come out, happened to be one of our officers, Officer Moreno, correct? If you recall correctly. Morales, Morales. Okay, Officer Morales came out. And I was surprised to learn as we were speaking behind on, uh, on the side of the stage was he's a three-time combat veteran. I believe he went to Afghanistan twice and once to Iraq. And uh, he was able to speak, and his comments were like just, they, they were such good comments where he mentioned he was very proud to serve our country and serve our country in combat. And he was very proud to continue to serve our community. I thought those were great comments by one of our peace officers here in, in Brawley. And so we gave him a little recognition. And then uh, obviously we came out in the parade uh, representing the city. Uh, it's first time putting together a flow. Uh, that was interesting and uh, got pretty warm out there. So it wasn't very comfortable in boots. But overall, a great, great weekend. So happy to be out there and, and, and just hang out with the folks in the community. So thank you all, especially especially to staff who I saw working around the clock. You guys are fantastic, and you guys do a great job. Great job. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, Councilman Nava. No, thank you, uh, and thank everyone for, for attending tonight. Um, I do want to thank, <clears throat> of course, the, the, they're going to be repeated, but thank the Chamber of Commerce their entire staff, uh, Ramiro, Karen, Michelle, they did a fantastic job along with their ambassadors and their volunteers, a lot of volunteer forces that helped put that event together. And certainly uh, this would not be possible without City of Brawley staff. I know um, all of you worked really hard to make that event happen. Thousands of people down Main Street for Mariachi and then the parade, and it's just fantastic to see everybody out there. I did ask some police officers today, you know, what the response was from the crowd. And general, generally, I mean, people were well-behaved. I mean, there was a few instances, but generally well-behaved. And that's good. You know, people have been, um, you know, saving their energy for, for quite some time. So maybe that was a concern for, for some of us. But thankfully, um, everyone enjoyed themselves and had a good time and, and were out there and, and uh, you know, got to enjoy our community. Yeah. Like people come out here, and, and that's when the spirit of Brawley comes alive. So I do want to thank the public as well for um, their support of uh, the recent measure, and it helps the community. So I'm just thrilled to see that happen, and uh, I know not everybody was entirely supportive of it, but I think uh, because of city staff presenting the information out to the public, it was successful. And, and uh, you know, that, that goes to show that people, they care about our community, they care about um, what we're presenting, it's very important that our voice is heard as a, as a city staff, mm -hmm. and um, they listen to that. So remember, we are the experts. They view us as that. City staff, each of you in your departments, you're the expert. You know, when you have that interaction, you are the expert, and we are as well. So thank you, um, residents of City of Brawley and, and uh, the voting public. Thank you very much for your support. Um, and again, just um, thanking uh, PD for their assistance today. Um, they're always very responsive, and so is every department whenever I reach out for, for assistance, and they're always very, very responsive, and they, they certainly care about our, our community. I know there's a lot to, to govern and look after in Brawley, and, um, you know, I drive around all the time. I see <coughs> issues throughout the city, and uh, I've, I have been able to spend some time with, with uh, you know, our graffiti abatement officer and, and others, you know, just interact with staff. And, and you know, the sentiment really is um, – is very positive, you know, and that's good to see. You know, not to say we don't have lulls in, in morale, but, I mean, right now I think people are feeling good about their role within the city, the changes within the city. We're seeing our financial structure changing and being positive. It's just better, a better vibe. And I feel better on council, you know, because going through through COVID and, and all the restrictions, trust me, that wears on us too. It wears on us heavily. And so I'm glad that we're, we're moving away from that. But uh, anyway, not to keep it super long, I know it has been. Thank you all very much for your, your effort, your support, your work. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's enjoy the rest of the year. And uh, let's have a great uh, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, George. Mayor Pro Tem Couchman. Okay. Um, I attended the Chamber Mixer at Sun, Sun Community Federal Credit Union. Great, great mixer. Uh, I attended Cowboy Poetry, and the mayor and I did a presentation at Cowboy Poetry, met with critical acclaim. Uh, we almost got standing ovations. Almost, and almost. Th then the mayor sang a song, <laughs> and he's, he's a great singer and, and played the guitar. And that was, was, a, it, that was, was we had a great ser time. Serenading you now? Yeah, he serenaded me. Okay. Yeah. He played the violin, and we got a lot of points on that there one. There you go. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I attended the Mariachi Festival on Wednesday. There, there were at least... 
there were a lot of people there. And I was set up by my friend Ramon. But, but other than that, the, I, I knew there was a problem when he kept emphasizing that I was already entered and then all the other contestants were, were of the female mm-hmm. persuasion. <laughs> and then I knew there was a problem right then, you know. But I went along with it. I was a good sport. I came in last, you know. I mean, and I still got a prize. So that was, that was a good, that was a good part good. of it. And then I, did, I went to the Elks Lodge on Thursday and also attended the Boys and Girls Club Cowboy Bingo uh, situation. And then Friday, I went to the Cattle Call Committee Dinner. Uh, Saturday, I went to the parade, the Elks Barbecue. Well, we sent out for the barbecue, but I did partake in that as a, because I am an elk. And Barbecue on the Bluffs, which was put on by uh, Buzz Shot, Laura McDonald, uh, Tom DeBose, and some other individuals in the energy in the energy field. And they, they sponsored a Barbecue on the Bluff. And it was a return of that event, and I'm thankful for the city for making that possible and the rodeo committee for making that possible for us to have that. Um, uh, I also on Thursday attended, went to El Centro and attended the ceremony for Veterans Day for the, the Vietnam Traveling Wall. And I was there for the ceremony uh, representing the city. And I had been there in 1994 when that, that wall, where a different wall, I think, came to, the Saint, to Buckland Park. So I, needed, I felt the need to be there. And I was there to support our local veterans and the Vietnam veterans and thank them for their service. And so I, I attended that also. And... Uh, yesterday, I attended uh, the Imperial Valley Community Foundation luncheon uh, celebrating National Philanthropy Day, and I was somewhat surprised and shocked to receive Volunteer of the Year. Uh, from I was nominated by the Rotary, and I did receive Volunteer of the Year, and it was a nice award, and, and I was very, very uh, humbled and, and very surprised by that award, So, and I was very thankful for that. And I want to say thank you to all the city staff for doing a great job at Cattle Call, and I'm happy to see that Cattle Call's back and that the city's involved in that and successfully involved in that. With that, that's my report. Thank you, Mayor Protect. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much. Yes, well, like everyone else, I had a very eventful Cattle Call week and, and grateful for uh, just the activity that was everywhere and, and what looked like a very clean collaboration between city staff and employees and, and the Chamber of Commerce and the entire community. Um, I, I know in years past there's been, I've heard, you know, contentions and that kind of stuff between different, uh, different groups that, that all participate in Cattle Call, and I didn't hear any of that this year. And overall it just looked like it was a very positive event for everyone that, that chose to be involved. So I'm, I'm really glad that that's how that went. And I think a lot of people were just anxious to, to get out and do something. And, and as the weather cools and, and this is our signature event, people were just wanting to be involved in a positive way. So that was great. Um, I did enjoy performing with my mayor pro tem over here for, for Cowboy Poetry. Been talking about doing that for a few years. And so we, we pulled it off this year with one little practice ahead of time. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it, was, it seemed to be well-received. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, I, uh, Tyler and I attended, and Donnie attended, a, uh, a little luncheon out at San Diego State University, Brawley Extension, uh, with Dean Wheeler and, and a couple of administrative staff to uh, just discuss some of their plans for their facility out there and, and how they're going to work together with, with renewable energies and, and STEM programs locally. So... Uh, looks like there's a lot of grant money available to them, and hopefully they'll get those grants, and, and we'll see some benefit from that here in Brawley as well. Um, I attended a Parks and Rec meeting today and um, got some good news about um, a collaboration with Brawley Union High School um, regarding replastering the, the Lion Center pool. So um, they'll, they'll be kicking in some money toward that, and that'll be, uh, that'll be good to get that done. I know Donnie will be excited about that. <laughs> Um, I got a lot of really good feedback on on both, as George mentioned, um, you know, just the city staff and employees throughout throughout Cattle Call, um, and I got some good feedback on the the PD uniforms, uh, Cattle Call uniforms. A lot of impressed people. Sure, so uh, we'll keep up that tradition, I think. And, and, and I see our fire chief went bootleg yeah, and he, did he, the same thing. Yeah, I saw he, that. He, he, he tried to <laughs> grab onto those coattails. Yeah. 
Um, but it's it's stuff like that that I, I know our, our new police chief, well, relatively new police chief, um, Jimmy Duran, is trying to think of ways to increase morale, as, as George was talking about. And um, it, it's little things like that that I think that that bond our, our men and women in our PD closer together um, and and give them a sense of belonging, like, hey, this is our community and our and our the members of our community support us. Uh -huh. And um, so we are very grateful to all of our, our safety services, law enforcement, fire department, for the work that you do to, to keep us safe and, and keep us moving. So we appreciate that. And we're proud to see you guys looking good for Cattle Call. And um, Commander Blackstone, I never got an opportunity to watch you uh, ride the wild horse this year, so I don't, I don't even know how you did. But I will say I watched your son ride a sheep and – you know, take take home the prize for the whole weekend, and that was pretty awesome to see. An all star, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you did well. Yeah. So my son was impressed. He wants to do that next year. We'll see. You. <laughs> He's, uh, may, may have to go to you for training. So. <laughs> it's really easy. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Sure. Maverick held on for for many many seconds. Yeah. It was awesome to watch. I'm just kidding. Okay, and uh, that. Oh, I, I will say. Um, that uh, along those lines of feedback, I, I spoke with um, Laura McDonald at the at the barbecue, and she went went for several minutes on on the change that she sees in the spirit of the city, you know, in city management and and staff um, in in collaboration for for that event in particular, but just in general, um, there's a, just a, a different feel in the city of Brawley now than in years past, and so mm -hmm. that, and it was a positive comment, so. I see that as well. Um, it's been, I know we're not quite there yet, but, but this has been a really amazing experience to get to be the mayor of Brawley um, this year. It, I, I, was, I went into it with a lot of trepidation because, you know, we were still in COVID and it, it looked like it was going to be a very difficult year. And, and Donnie kept trying to tell me, you know, no, it's, we, we've got your back. It's going to be good. It's going to be a good year. But I am, <clears throat> I, I always say, the nice thing about being a pessimist is that you're always either right or pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so, there you go. And I'm one too. in a few more weeks, when I hand the gavel over to Sam, if I can just limp through those last few weeks without any anything major going wrong, oh. I will. I will be. I will be yeah, pleasantly that's, surprised. That's yes. Right there. Yeah, thanks. That's, yes. Thanks, thanks. that's the future that's of Broadway. Me Cowboy. There's the future, future mayor. Broadway. The future mayor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're in trouble. You can see wow. my wife backing up towards the Thank you, Armando. Don't blame her. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. She's laughing at you. Not with yeah. Yeah. Why is she pointing yeah. and covering her mouth? Yeah. Right. Mr. Mayor, before you sign up, just a, a shout out to you. And I mean, because we all reported quite a bit, but, you know, also the partnership, ongoing partnership with the Cal Call committee. I think they delivered some incredible yes. performances. Yeah. I heard yeah. a lot, you know, yes. about yeah. that and the attendance there. So, um, not to forget that is a you right. know a public partnership. You know, yes. that comes together. So, if, if anyway. one, one, I also forgot one more comment. I might. I just uh, wanted to thank Mr. Max Reyes, who has been putting on that event every year for thirty three years now. So, um, you know, it's it's a great event, and and he's doing it every every single year. So I sh he deserves an honorable mention. So, All right. And I forgot. Oh, oh yeah. Let's go. yeah. I didn't go back to you. Got more to say. I should just open the phone. <laughs> and my okay. aunt. Let's go. So Any comments from staff? I, just, I couldn't go. I live with myself. I didn't Everyone say just that. wants to go home. Yeah, we all just want to go home. <laughs> okay. I will end my report with that, and we will move to item nine, city attorney report. It's not really a, an attorney report, but, but my wife and I both have businesses right on the plaza, and that giant event was literally on our doorsteps <laughs> and i have to give a shout out to public works because when i got to the jojo monday night uh, it looked like nothing had happened mm -hmm. so clearly there was some hard work put yeah, in definitely as always well thank you for that uh, item 10 city clerk report just to remind everybody of the tree lighting ceremony december the 1st at 5 p.m at the kiosk all right mm -hmm. you can send us the invite yeah. please yeah Tree lighting. Okay. Okay. And then we're the still working yeah. on the Santa Claus Santa route Claus, for right. the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. Okay. okay. And the reorganization right. yeah. is taking place when? when Not we on. Do we haven't. I don't know that we've we've nailed that down. But are we thinking uh, <laughs> the, the first yeah. meeting? Uh huh. Yes. Do you want to do it earlier? Well, do you want to do it at yeah. six? Yeah. Or? 
December 7th, January 2023. Yeah. December 7th, the regular meeting? Yeah, my thought is that Same if we keep or? streamline it so we don't have a whole lot of extra uh, it's okay. agenda it's items okay with me. on yeah. that. And we'll same time? That bit. Same time? Yeah, same time, okay. 6 p.m. Yeah. on December 8th. Let's do it. Okay. Totally. I, I'll, yeah, we can get to, I'll bring some refreshments or something. We'll figure something out. Sounds All right. Good. With that, do we have a closed session? No, we don't. Okay. I will adjourn the meeting at 9 o'clock p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving.